Hello, and welcome to episode 99 of Random Encounter. And I have to realize now, I have to redo this intro, because I've been saying for the longest time, the RPG fan podcast, but we have two other shows. So that really makes me out to be a dick, that I keep saying, like, this is the only RPG fan podcast. So this is... This and is, RPG fan podcast. Yeah, this is Random Encounter, an RPG fan podcast. I'm your host, Robert Steinman, Pale Robbie on the boards. Uh, joining me today is the man who just spent the entire, what, two days moving everything out of your apartment? That's me, Stephen Myrick, Tails on the boards. Also joining us is somebody who helped me do that. That would be me, Caitlin Argeros, Lean Cazero on the boards, and man, am I tired. Caitlin, you are a trooper. Like, anybody that helps a friend move is, like, the best people in the world. You deserve a coffee and a pat on the back. And that voice right there is Derek Heemsbergen. What's up? Embryon on the boards. I'm playing a lot of uh, Mother 3 these days. We'll Mother 3? Uh, you, are you pl- you, that's right. You're playing the uh, English language translation, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that. Okay. Yep. Uh, we also nice. have attorney at law, Jesse Wu. Hi, Jesse Wu. I'm the super dog on the boards. Attorney at law, news dude. Attorney at law. Uh, I, I, we need like a. Is there a DVD collection of Harvey Birdman? There should be. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I, I should get that. I really liked Harvey Birdman. Should. Birdman. I love when Birdman Fred... video game was pretty disappointing though. I that bummed me out a little bit. But when mm. Fred when Fred Flintstone was like Tony Soprano, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. And then we also have uh, Mike Solosi. It's like Bola Santosi from Just Cause Two. That's how I think about your last name every time I say it. Sure. Uh, I'm Mike. I'm Monsoon <laughs> on the boards. And, you know, I tried playing Mother 3 several years ago, but for some reason, I would get a weird delay for all of the rhythm game attacking stuff on my emulator. Oh, it is so a little it, off, I think, yeah. Yeah, so I, it felt like I was doing it wrong every time, and that, oh. that bummed me out too much. Maybe you okay. were doing it wrong, Scrub. Uh, uh, right? Oh, well, that's good. a shame. Uh, oh, so- I have anxiety. So we got lots to talk about today. Uh, Steven, I'm glad that you're here because you're going to be leaving us for Japan. Well, I'm not leaving the show, though. I'm just going to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like la- it's not like last time in 2010 when I went and I could only record from a smoky internet cafe with a bunch of Japanese guys whispering. So uh, <laughs> I have an actual apartment this time with internet. So I'll it be did able- give the show like a real jazzy vibe because it was like Hi, I'm <laughs> Stephen Myrink and uh, I'm here about video games. <laughs> this is NPR. Who he this oh, here pun. on the Quiet Storm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Derry Merbles, and joining me today is Robert Steinman. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, video games, including uh, some real awesome things that we've been playing. Uh, so I want to talk about Dragon Quest, because Square Enix doesn't want to talk about Dragon Quest in America, but I want right? to talk about Dragon Quest. Bastards. Even when the Dragon Quest creator tried to talk about Dragon Quest outside of Japan, he got <laughs> shushed by the Square Enix bosses. That is actually what happened. Uh, so Dragon Quest Eleven has been announced, ladies and gentlemen, and Woo! I can't tell if Square Enix is brilliant or if they're a bunch of damn fools for how they're doing this. I think it's brilliance. I think it's, it's something kind of amazing. Something it. it. It's a really transparent maneuver to get as many people playing Dragon Quest as possible, except for the part where they don't localize it outside of Japan. Mm-hmm. So Mike, go ahead and describe what exactly they're doing. All right. Well, there are two versions of Dragon Quest XI that we know of. There's the uh, one for the PS4 and one for the 3DS. Outside of that, there was also some scuttlebutt, some scuttlebutt about it maybe appearing on the NX, but that seemed to be just an offhand remark or some unsubstantiated rumors. But in general, the uh, PS4 version is going to be big and beautiful. Unreal Engine 4 looks gorgeous. I can hardly believe what I'm looking at when I saw those uh, those gifs and stuff from uh, that are event. Are you describing Robert's Diamond or Dragon Quest XI? Wow, thank you, Derek. That actually that, that was really <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> I've been having some body image issues as of late, and I really appreciate that. Oh, I have bro. seen Robert in person, and he is a handsome man that made me question things. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. right. The show's getting a little deep now. Let's okay. anyway, yeah. keep going. So, right, the 3DS version is doing something that seems overwhelming and crazy, but is really, really freaking interesting. Uh, at the, I think at the beginning of the game, you have a, you know, a, a 3D visuals, sort better looking Dragon Quest IX thing going on at the top screen. And on the bottom screen, you have a top down NES or SNES Dragon Quest uh, moving along, you know, square tiles thing on the bottom screen. And 
I, I think how they explained it was um, you can switch between either that you you have both going at once for the beginning, and then for most of the game you can switch between either view. Mm -hmm. And it, that's amazing. I it's I mean it's it almost seems like too much sensory overload if they had both going on simultaneously the whole time, but having that choice available is incredible to me. Now. I think it's telling, or maybe I'm reading too much into something when they say that they're going to make the PS4 version with the Unreal Engine. I was really expecting them to use the Final Fantasy 15 engine. Uh, isn't Kingdom Hearts 3, is that being Unreal, or is that their own proprietary engine? Steven, what is it? I think it's Unreal, isn't it? Is it? I think so. He, um... Oh, did he step out? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, Steven sounded really like Caitlin and Derek for a second. <laughs> That's, that's me not paying attention to the Skype chat and playing Diablo. But uh, do we think that that's telling that maybe they don't have the confidence in the Final Fantasy XV engine? Or do you think they just want to get this thing out quickly by using Unreal Tech? I, I wonder if they just want to have something out there first before they start using it in other games. Like, they want to have XV released and to have that be, like... This is and, what this can do before we start, you know, start pouring it out to all of our games. Well, they've they've said that they only plan on using the Luminous Engine for Final Fantasy 15, and that's it. Which I, so, I think yeah. that's a real shame. The FF7 well, remake yeah. isn't going to be on the Luminous Engine either. Right. And I, I don't know if that's because they want to give it its own visual identity, or if it's just not cost-efficient for them to use that and reprogram it, like, to f suit other gameplay mechanisms or what, what it is, but... Um, I think I wouldn't say that them using Unreal Four is like indicative of them being cheap or anything like that. I think it's just what works best with what, what they're trying to create. Yeah, I, I think it's also an unfair assumption to to say they're being cheap or going an easier route by doing that. I it, I would assume that they thought they could make the best game they could with the Unreal Engine. Maybe it's a maybe it's the difficulty of the FF fifteen engine. Maybe it's a cost measure. I it's kind of it's a lot of speculation saying why they would make that choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not trying to read too much into it. I just found it to be a little surprising. Like, they had spent so much time on this engine. You know, there's all the talk about the Fox engine for Metal Gear Solid Five. Like, they put all this time into engines, and then they just say, ah, screw it, we're just going to use Unreal, uh, or, you know, some people who are in less of a position using id tech. Yikes. Uh, I guess maybe that's just helping them get the game out faster. Which is awesome, because I, I would imagine that Dragon Quest XI, seeing as how next year is the 30th anniversary of Dragon Quest, I believe, they're most likely going to try to get that game out next year in Japan. Now, the question is, are we going to get it in the States? We better! Yes. I think we will. I don't know what their problem is with not localizing Dragon Quest right now. Like, Except I think the, the demand is clear. Game. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like they may be testing the waters with that a bit. And didn't they also release a statement of some kind that was like, if you want to see more Dragon Quest, you better buy Dragon War Dragon Quest Warriors. And it's like, but they're not even the same thing. Yeah, I'm not like, interested in that game like at all. It's like better buy Metroid Prime Pinball if you want Metroid Prime 3. Well, Metroid Prime Pinball <laughs> is amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, Metroid Prime Pinball is awesome. Isn't there, there already a Metroid Prime really... 3? Yeah, there, well, yeah, but I was I think it oh. came out around that time period. Oh, okay, sure. He, he's just using the argument. Like yeah, I, I, I understand. I was just being annoying about the details. But yeah, go on. It's just frustrating. It's like cool. I, I still really want Dragon Quest Seven. I don't know if I want Dragon Quest Eight though. I don't know if I want the 3DS game because I've seen the visuals and it, it definitely looks nice for a 3DS game, but it doesn't look as good as the PS2 game, and that's kind of a shame. Like yeah, I. But they're adding a lot to that one. That I mean, is... I guess Dragon Quest Seven is is possibly more substantial because it's a complete like new engine complete remake but uh right there's enough additional stuff in eight in the new one to i think justify I really and i mean requested. like xenoblade doesn't look as good as it could on 3ds like it does kind of bug me when i look at it especially the, the biggest thing with xenoblade is that the the interface is really blurry for some reason mm -hmm. but Last with dragon time. quest yeah like i'm okay with dragon quest 8 looking a little bit downgraded visually as long as everything still looks sharp like menu wise but I mean, I get what you're saying. That you probably you don't want to tarnish the memory of Dragon Quest Eight because that's a beautiful damn game. That is a really good game. I I'd say that's probably one of the most beautiful PlayStation Two games out there, and it is really held up nicely. I just ah, uh, it's See, like I actually, 
Go to, go ahead, Stephen. I have to disagree. I actually don't mind the visual downgrade because I think I'd be more likely to play that game handheld. More importantly to me is that it runs at a consistent frame rate. Yeah, that's, that's right. a really good point. Xenoblade is ugly as poo on 3DS, but it runs perfectly, at yeah. least as much as I've played. And that's, to me, more important because... To be fair, unless you're playing it on an upscaled emulator, Xenoblade is sort of ugly on a TV too. Yeah, yeah. I got the uh, the, yeah, what the is grass, it? the aliasing on the grass is just horrendous. If you the get the textures, they're pretty blurry. What, what was it? The component or comp- It's component cables, right? That the the yeah. Wii could actually use. Yeah. I actually yeah. bought some component cables just for Xenoblade. It did look substantially better. Yeah, it helps. Like faux HD, like 480p. It it looked okay. I remember doing the same thing actually. Like I specifically went out and bought those cables because I was like, this game looks so bad. Yeah, it, that's yeah, that's one of the reasons like. like princess. What was that? Mm-hmm. I got component cables for Twilight Princess so I could look cool on the spinner. We're uh, <laughs> we're remodeling the, we're remodeling the office hopefully uh, in the house here in the next month or so and putting in another set of bookshelves. And part of me wants to go out and just get like an old CRT TV just so I can play like my PlayStation Two games and they don't look like absolute butt on an HD screen. Mm-hmm. I'm really thinking about making that investment. I kind of wish I would have kept my old CRT because uh, like one of the reasons why. Well, I upgraded to an HD TV back when that was a thing, and I I used to be really into Beatmania 2DX, and so I had like a whole bunch of them imported. Like I had one of those magic disc things so that you could uh, unlock your PS2 CD tray and pull it out and use this like basically region lock breaker thing. Yeah, um, um, so I, I have to... one of those called Swap Magic that replaces the the top right. loader of my uh, PS2. I did that so oh. I could play uh, so I could play Tales of Rebirth among other among nice. some other things. It's a good reason. Yeah, I did the same thing, although I had a fat PS2, so I actually had to cut the original plastic off. And yeah, not that's the one I had. The one not, the new one on. yeah, I, have a, I have a slim one, so I just had to get a tiny screwdriver and, and uh, replace some things. It, it worked great. I just yeah. I just bought a Japanese PS2 when I was well, in... Well, fine, Japan. Caitlin. Damn it, Caitlin. <laughs> some of those answers the best Broke. one, isn't it? It was. It was convenient, because I was already in Japan, and I, uh, what did I, I, I wanted to play a 12, because 12 came out while I was in uh, Oh, That's when, a good when were you in Japan, Caitlin? I didn't know that. My junior year of college, um, the 05 of six school year. She's been in Japan longer than me. Oh, well, I, I learned something today. That'll soon change, but for now. <laughs> Actually, speaking of Final Fantasy XII, I want to take a tangent on this tangent. So yesterday, I was in a different part of town than I normally was. and oh, I, I saw you get on this on Right? Yeah. So I swung by a GameStop. Um, it was actually a GameStop that I used to work at, like, eight years ago um i'm on i'm just on the other side of tucson at this point so i went in there for some reason and i was browsing around just killing time and they had an entire shelf full of the final fantasy 12 collector's guide and they were all marked down to 97 cents a piece and they were all sealed and it was the so, special edition right the one that yeah has the, yeah and I, so they have collectible covers and there are like six variants one for each of the characters and you don't know which one you're going to get until you break the plastic and open the damn thing so i definitely bought all of them because i'm a totally reasonable person right (laughs) so so i'm like sitting in my car it's 100 degrees outside i'm sweating my balls off and i'm just sitting here like opening these strategy guides and what like am i gonna get all six and i eventually did get all six which is stupid because i don't know what the hell i'm gonna do with them uh maybe someday i'll have like a giant glass case where i can put all of my ff12 everything but uh yeah so that was the thing i definitely did anyway didn't hook me up with bosh I only got one Bosch. Captain really? Bosch. Yeah. I, I got like four ashes and everything else was, I got one of everything else. I feel like every episode that Caitlin's on, I learn more about her type. So we got Geralt, we got Bosch. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm learning more about Caitlin every day. <laughs> anyway, you know, to go back a tangent. I love, love Garrus, so add him to the mix. <laughs> there you go. And you love Agrius, so oh, well, she's what does that mean? That's because Agrius is awesome, and she everybody awesome. should love Agrius. Yeah. Means I swing both ways. Lightning know. stab all day. Go, oh, girl. To go back one tangent before we get too lost, um, the, the okay. PS2 thing. We were talking about CRT TV. So um, I, I had one of those for playing Beat Mania, and when I got an HDTV, there's enough of an input lag slash like display lag on the HDTV that you can't accurately play Beat Mania because mm-hmm. it just doesn't register correctly. And I really miss, like, I, I noticed that, especially with any old games, like anything pre- we uh it just looks better on a crt generally like i i like scan lines too i think they look cool scan lines so, do look cool i'm okay so with I, that. I miss the the one-to-one input of older tvs and hdtv still hasn't quite gotten that in there but yeah it's the same reason people play melee on um on crtvs and mm-hmm. tournament 
Yeah, I, I should just go out and go. I gotta imagine I, I could get like a twenty-inch CRT for like a hundred bucks or something, but finding them might actually be tough because nobody carries them anymore. Right? I have a giant fat thirty-six inch CRT that I still uh, have my PS2 attached to, and oh, those things are so heavy. I was yeah, yeah. God, I I mean I live in a townhouse, and taking that from the basement to the top floor in my bedroom was an ordeal. That's but... how people end up dead. You read yeah. about that on the news. You just drop that, yeah. I mean, I paid for college by working at a moving company, so I I know how to carry <laughs> things upstairs. But I should have been there for when Stephen was moving. Oh my god! But uh, yeah, I mean, I was just playing um, Digital Devil Saga the other day, and it looks great. Shocker! I'm so proud of you. I'm actually playing it the second time. That game's encounter rate is so bad. Yeah, but, it is. Yeah. That well, I mean, it's it's a new game plus, so I can cover people's immunities and stuff. It's it's oh, not okay. as bad. But, yeah, I'm making Smash. a perfect save file for DDS2. So getting back to uh, the Dragon Quest again real quick. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I think we're going to get 11 in America. I agree with Steven. Yeah. I, think, I think we were all kind of saying that we're going to get in America. Do you think we get both versions? Yes. Okay. I think Nintendo helps localize the 3DS one. Which one will you guys get? Both. PS4. I got both. Go. I, I don't know. I'm uh, mm. other people answer because I'm of two minds. They're so they're so different. Like I, they're going to be the same story and everything, but I feel like playing them is going to be a completely different experience. And when you consider yeah. that the 3DS version is like two games, uh, I'm most looking forward to PS4 because I'm still really much a fan of like sitting in front of a giant TV screen and just settling in with a long epic RPG. That's special to me. It always has been, and I love it. But. Uh, there's also something to be said of the convenience of a handheld, and that it looks great. Like both versions of the 3DS one look fantastic. They really do. They really do. Uh, do we think they're going to have the same battle system? There were kind of some. They have rumor. a different battle system. They've yeah. already said. That. So what what's that going to be about? Uh, do you guys have a thought on that? Like, is one going to be turn based? Is one going to be action? Like the, the console one has like Final Fantasy XII style, like you roam around and see monsters, and then it goes into a turn based system. Okay. Uh, but you don't like have like a screen shatter effect. If oh, I... yeah, so, so there's no cutaway. It's like Chrono Trigger, where the monsters exist in the environment uh, uh -huh. that you're walking around in. Mm -hmm. It looks okay. so good, and 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 the main character looks like Trunks. So my I... wife is like totally into it. He is the first <laughs> character I've seen drawn by Akira Toriyama that doesn't make me want to vomit all over the place. Why do you hate Joy? I hate you so much. No. This is why. I, this is exactly why I didn't want to have you back on the podcast. I have been having so much <laughs> whoa, fun whoa. watching no, no, Dragon no, no, Ball Z Kai, no, no, no. and so... you're just a hater. So Toriyama is a good artist, <laughs> but my problem with his art is my same problem with everything in Street Fighter. Everybody looks like they have muscles on top of their muscles. Like, hey, those are nice cheeks. Yeah, they're made of biceps. <laughs> like, like, every character in Dragon Ball, including the women, looks like a hulky man. That's not true. Bulma doesn't look hulky. Come on now. She has sort of boxy shoulders, but I, that, I think Steven's being, a little, <laughs> Steven's being a little unfair. No, I don't think I'm being unfair. I don't, I don't like the style. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the art style. I, I, either. What about Chrono Trigger, though? I don't. No, I don't even like Chrono Trigger's. Like, what? The sprites look amazing in Chrono Trigger. I, and I like. I love the game, and then I bought the game, and saw the box art, and I was like, oh my god, everybody looks terrible. I am really sorry to the listeners for just uh, kamehamehing your ears right now. I'm sorry about that. In fact, I'm gonna throw that gauntlet down. All the character artwork looks way better in Chrono Cross, except for maybe. Why? Why? <laughs> I love Chrono Cross, dude. You know I'm like the Chrono Cross defender, but some of those character designs look terrible. Yes, some of them are bad, but let's also be fair. Toriyama has designed a lot of characters. Yeah, there are some really bad Dragon Ball characters. Well, okay, too. Mr. Popo is probably the most racist thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, haven't, haven't you uh, seen, you like... Probably, you should probably not read some of the old uh, The Spirit comics from the 30s. <laughs> well, Rob, you said you're watching the new Dragon Ball Z, right? Kai or whatever. Isn't there a new group of villains? Because I saw this picture that was like, so the new group of villains in Dragon Ball Z Kai is basically the Backyardigans. And I, they're like I think you're talking about Dragon people. Ball Super. Because oh, I haven't Super, been watching okay. Super. Uh, Kai is just a retelling of Dragon Ball Z with oh, all the all the filler has been removed, so it is just like they actually kill Frieza in like 50 episodes instead of 200. Wow. It is something yeah. I can actually recommend Kai. I, I said it on the last show. Like I can recommend Kai to everyone. It because, sounds like they're doing what they're doing with Evangelion, where they're like, all right, we're going to retell this and cut out stupidness. Well, the problem is that Evangelion has gotten even more pretentious, which I didn't think was possible. It's approaching some level of quantum singularity at this point, but I still love it. Uh, uh, I put but, on this picture I put in Skype chat. <laughs> tell, tell me those are not the backyard again. 
Yes, they got the penguin. They got the weird curly antenna thing. <laughs> it's identical. That is amazing. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, and fake that though. weird cat guy is. I, I think Dragon Ball Super is an adaptation of, or starting out as an adaptation of the last two Dragon Ball Z movies, because that weird like Egyptian cat looking dude is the enemy from the yeah, Dragon Ball the movie gods. from last year. Oh, uh, is this not real though? Is this fake? No, yeah, no, that's real. All right, that, that's, that's Toriyama that, artwork. I've been reading the manga, and I recognize the those not backyardigans. <laughs> what are the backyardigans? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Oh, I guess it's. I guess this might actually be fake. Now that I'm looking into it, by and by looking into it, I mean like reading the first damn comment. <laughs> <laughs> but it says it was somebody's fan art, but it really does look like. Them. I really love the Dragon Quest art. I got so excited about Dragon Quest XI's announcement that I found uh, Dragon Quest VI on DS while I was in West Virginia, and I was just like sold. You know, probably won't play it for a year or so, but I, I was just like, I need to play it. I, I love Dragon Quest. There's just something so wholesome about it. Like, yeah, it's yeah, I agree. It's like the Dragon Quest games are like sort of innocent spirit of adventure fairy tale games, while Final Fantasy games are occasionally convoluted sci-fi medieval messes. And I say that with with a lot of affection. I, but, I, I say that with affection too. I I agree with you. And uh, I've beaten all of the Dragon Quest games 1 through 9, except for 7, which makes me really, really want that 7 3DS remake all the more. But, yeah, I, I love Dragon Quest. I miss it. I, I really want to get more Dragon Quest in me soon. I, I yeah. hope they do the right thing. Just please do the right thing, Square Enix. Like, bring that out. I hope I they bring a theater of them over here as well. I thought that was coming out in America, the Dragon they Quest theater. They haven't said anything. Oh, I actually... telling me... Sorry, go ahead, Dirk. I was going to say, I just imported it, because uh, for my birthday, I decided to treat myself to a Japanese 3DS. So cool. I, I bought it with that, and it's getting here tomorrow, and I can't wait. I can't wait. John, was, John bought it and was telling me that he does not like the 3D uh, Dragon Quest theater rhythm as much as Final Fantasy, because the battle perspective is really hard to gauge. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more like it, Guitar Hero, a score. isn't it? It's what? It's more like Guitar Hero, like it's coming from the top. Yeah, but apparently they have, like, a weird arc to them. So, like, there's, like, perspective shifting where they come in at a 3D angle. Oh, and oh, so, so, they ha- so they have it as, like, coming from the top with uh, without the characters visible, like a like an old... Yeah, yeah. it looks like Dragon Quest okay. rather than Final Fantasy, which is cool. That sounds or, well, cool. looks like yeah. Dragon Quest before 8, that is. I'm not sure how it's going to... I'll have to check it out, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll report back and let it you know. It makes me wonder what they're going to do when they inevitably make a Kingdom Hearts theater rhythm. There has not been any Kingdom Hearts DLC for the uh, f- for the other theater rhythm games, so I think it's a very, very logical uh, step for them to take. And I can already hear Steven just jumping up and down. <laughs> well, speaking of Kingdom Hearts, I actually got into an argument with one of my former students this past week about when do we think Kingdom Hearts 3 is coming out. He Thank seems you. He seems to think it's going to come out next year, in 2016. Oh. No, not the, I don't think it's coming out the same year as Final Fantasy. <laughs> Yeah, no, no way. And I, I think it's going to be 2017. A, a, am I going to be right? Because at Gamescom, they kind of seem to back off a little bit on Final Fantasy 15. Is that going to be late next year? Like, uh, oh, Mr. Steinman said. I, I feel like maybe Japan might get its late spring. Well, but... they, they actually already said well, they're just simultaneous release. release right? Oh, really? Okay. I, I think it's going to be middle of the year. Yeah, then definitely later. They, they said they know when it's coming out. They said they're on track, and they said it's not coming out in 2017, which is just the vaguest vague that ever vague to vague. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so 2018, right? 2018. They're like, it's not coming out in 2017. We won't make you wait that long. And I'm like, so... Does that mean 2016? Because that would have been a much it faster means way to say that. 2020. We're actually going to go back in time, release it in 2010, and you're all going to really love Ooh, it. I like that. It, it means please be excited. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be time compression, and it's going to work. Uh, I would say September. I think September at the very earliest. But I, I don't think there's any way Kingdom Hearts 3 comes out next year. Now here's the question. Do we think Kingdom Hearts 3 before Final Fantasy VII Remake or after? Before. Before. Yeah. Or maybe the same year. I can see them releasing the remake the same year as Kingdom Hearts. That, that might be fair. That might yeah, be fair. About the same year, I don't think. I could. I okay. I could see maybe same year. Maybe because Obviously, I bet they're going to use either the Unreal Engine or Luminous on Seven. I'm guessing. Oh, I think that's going to be Unreal. Because Luminous seems like, like the Final Fantasy 15 engine. I now. think it's going to be Unreal too. Rob looks so cool. It's going to be so awesome, Sugoi. 
Sorry. I'm, I'm really Super sorry. Funny. I'm really sorry. That's crossing a weeaboo line that I am not willing to cross. I, I apologize. I've, I feel bad about that one. Okay, who's got games to talk about? Because I'm just going to go sit in the corner and think about what I just did. <laughs> Uh, well, your impressions on Divinity, Rob. Uh, yeah, Stephen and I got to play a little bit of Divinity together. Uh, Divinity Original Sin uh, in anticipation of the uh, Enhanced Edition and also the announcement of Divinity Original Sin 2 and that they're going to do a Kickstarter. We didn't get to play nearly enough, Stephen, because I was really enjoying myself, but uh, here you My are. My goal was Japan. just to, just to string you along and... Coming and, back. and make you want to play more. We can play more once I go to South Carolina. Okay, okay. No, I, I really was digging on it. I mean, it's just... To play a game that is completely built around a multiplayer isometric RPG, like classic computer RPG, is just so... It, it was freeing. And I was finally seeing what everybody was in love with about that game, whereas when I was playing it by myself... It felt a little fiddly to control four characters. It was kind of the Wasteland 2 problem of I have four characters with four inventories and four sets of skills, and this is getting a little cumbersome. But now Steven can take two, and I can take two, and it's a lot more manageable, and we're, like, talking to each other. I randomly killed the first two NPCs that we randomly came across. No, no, <laughs> no. I mean, let's, let's do, you tell them the whole story about that. So we're they're, like... They're, they're two drunk dudes, <laughs> and if you walk up to them, you start a dialogue where they're total jerks, and you can either... Convince them that you are the people who were supposed to be there, or you can murder them. Rob decided to bypass all of that and just fired an arrow and murdered one of them. <laughs> I wanted to see how strong my, uh, my my archery skill was, and it turned out it was very strong. He popped like a pimple. I was okay with that. Pops like a pimple. Gross. <laughs> well, that's how I used to describe uh, District 9 to people. Is I'm like, yeah, the, uh, the enemies and bad guys pop like pimples. I think that is incredibly accurate. Oh, like in Cloverfield? The first death in Cloverfield? Yeah! Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, no, we can definitely play more. I, I Like I said, Divinity is one of those games that like is a great game by itself, but co-op is sort of a magic ingredient, I feel, in a lot of cases. Yeah. And there are so few like really in-depth story RPGs with systems that complicated that also support, not only support, but sort of emphasize co-op. That it's sort of in a class of its own, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I would 100% agree with you. Like, I, I went from being like, oh, do I want to play Pillars of Eternity or do I want to play Divinity? And now it's just like, eh, Divinity, just because I can play it with you. Like, I'm, I'm really excited to try Pillars at some point, but I you went from like, what was that? I would wait to play to play Pillars till the expansion at this point because the expansion has a bunch of features yeah. that go back to the main game that make the main game better. So not that it needed them, but better yeah. results. I finished um, Act One of Pillars, but I'm gonna wait for the expansion before I continue because I mean, they fell by the wayside with Retro Encounter and other stuff taking up a lot of my time. Now, Steven, since you were big into Divinity Original Sin, I'm gonna ask you, what are you looking for with Divinity Two? Like, what do you want them to? Are you just looking for a sequel that's just bigger, badder, more badass, or are you looking for like specific differences? So the way they described it on their on their like pitch before they started their Kickstarter was that they want this to be their Baldur's Gate 2, which is to say Baldur's Gate 1 was a great game, but Baldur's Gate 2 is probably the best game that old Bioware ever made. And I know that's a bold claim, but I, probably the most well-rounded. Uh, which, it was basically just a bigger Baldur's Gate 1. With Divinity 2, they have so many interesting systems in place that bigger would actually add a lot because, you know, you add another type of element or you add another, like, you know, more ways for spells to interact. What I would love to see is basically a more focused main story, just you know, basically a better journal. All the stuff it sounds like they're doing in the Enhanced Edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, the journal's a little cumbersome. It was hard to figure out what quests I needed to do. I think their inventory system isn't terrible. It's not nearly as bad as Wasteland 2, in my opinion, but it's still a little cumbersome. Yeah, like the inventory I think is okay, and like stats and stuff, but what, what really needs an overhaul, and you know they're aware of it because you know people said and it's in the Enhanced Edition, is it needs a better map, because the map is fine, but it's very, like, zoomed up, and you can't move it around. And you didn't even see, later in the game, you have, like, 50 quests, so you just have 50 just tabs that you click, and, a, like, a ton of text pops down. There's no way to just see, what do I have to be doing with this quest? What about quests? What about quests? What about quests? I didn't want the potion. What if I didn't want the potion? Um... <laughs> And, you know, there are lots of other little things that they could do. Like, you know, the crafting system in Divinity is awesome, but it's a little bit obtuse because 
you know, it, it's so in depth, but it doesn't track what you've made. So like, you know, I'll, I'll be playing and I'll like, I was the crafter in the, the main game I played. And so like, I'm crafting stuff and then like 50 hours in, I'm like, oh my God, I can make like 5 million things. I don't remember how to make them. So some sort of like crafting log where it's like, here, you've made this. This is the recipe. You know, you, you just to have it there uh, would be really cool. So, I mean, that's a long winded way of saying basically more. Uh, do we think it's going to be four player? I'm pretty sure based on that artwork, it's going to be four player. Oh yeah, I would be un- I would be shocked if it wasn't because that's you know one of the most popular mods for the existing game is a four player mod. Um, that would I don't just make that be- game nuts. <laughs> well, see the the only thing is in four player Divinity One or Divinity Original Sin, the two side other characters are not part of the story. Like they're scripted characters, but all the 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 party banter between the two heroes is only two player. So I'm guessing if they were to do a four-player game, they would have it set up where like all four characters can interact and have conversations together because mm-hmm. those conversations affect your character traits, like you know whether you're compassionate or aggressive, and those affect your stats and your reputation. So I'm really... I would be shocked if it wasn't four-player though. That's that's an easy ad. Are we happy that they're doing a Kickstarter? I think so. There was a little bit of ba- there was a little bit of backlash online over the the second Kickstarter. People being like, "Hey, come on, man! You guys made so much money the first time. Why do you have to take more of our money?" I I don't see why they would be upset. They had an enormously successful Kickstarter, and then they delivered on that Kickstarter. So the precedent is they're really good at delivering on Kickstarter promises. Yeah, so, and not only that, but they also have the enhanced edition coming out for free for everybody who bought the first one. So it's you're getting basically two games. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, I, I'm is, with you guys. I was just pointing is, out the the backlash. It's, this is the well, opposite of the uh, Red Mega Ash Man situation. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> we were making the same comment. Go ahead. Yep. No, yeah, you're right. It's like, we haven't delivered our first game yet, and people are iffy on it. So please give us money for another game. I know it's not an RPG, but we've had so many great... They just RPG. opened a second Kickstarter for Red Ash. A second yeah. one. Like what? The first one failed. Yeah, wait, the first did, one failed. They're doing another one now. Did they serious? Oh my god! Wait a minute. No, oh, yeah. they, the first one made it because they had a backer. Like no, a ba- what happened? That oh, person god. funded them, but did not fund them via Kickstarter. So they came on Kickstarter and were like, "Yeah, all the money you've now donated is now going towards extra content because the game is guaranteed," which is great, I guess, if you backed it, but a little dishonest and not a cool precedent. But Jesse, you're saying they just started a second Kickstarter? Uh, well, Mike was saying that. I don't know about Mike, it, but Mike, Mike, second Kickstarter. Yeah, um, I thought I did. Where? Huh. Okay. I, I guess I can't. I guess I can't see it. I guess maybe I was imagining that. But they, they, they're, they, they've been extra shady about their I kickstarters. See, I see an article right now that just says like Red Ash the animation launches a new fundraiser for expanded okay. production as of that yesterday. That must be what it was. All right. Oh, it was, yeah. I just I, I, I saw really, they had done another one. I feel like they are capitalizing on nostalgia, and I think they have legitimately good designs. Like they want to make this world in this game. But I also think they're trying way too hard to capitalize and monetize. Yeah. Like, I, did we talk about this in the last episode I was on? I oh, we like... talked a little bit about it, but go ahead, go ahead, elaborate, because I, I feel like more news has come out that just makes this even more disgusting. You know, I just feel like, and you know, you can't point it at con- concept, you can't point it at Inti Creates. It's just like it feels like, feels like people's nostalgia is being used to wring out some cash. Like, and then sure. the backer they got, like the person funding or the company funding the game, is this Chinese company whose front page is a bunch of stolen <laughs> artwork from other games. Yeah. Talk about how terrible those games are. Like, there's Master Chief, and it's like, he is crap. And, like, what? I'm like, wow, this gives me faith in the product they're going to... Oh, got it. I never even looked into them. All I knew was that they were uh, a Chinese company that... And they, they credited them for whatever they had published before, and it was, like, nothing of note. Because yeah. the, the Kickstarter was like, we're working with celebrated publisher Fuse. And I was like, who? Who? I, I was like, the, the Insomniac game? Like, what are you guys talking about right uh, now? Like, I oh, think God. they're pretty prominent in China. I could be wrong. But I know they're like, they're pretty moneyed. Okay. I don't know, but man. I, mean, you know, I, I guess they're not making the game. They're just funding it. But if they're funding it, like, it just goes back to the whole point of why did you even have a Kickstarter if you have a, a, a yeah, person exactly. funding it? Because they're going to get final say. Now, obviously, we're not talking about RPGs here, but we've had so many RPGs get funded through Kickstarter that I think it's important to talk about this. Is this the type of thing that could end up, like, ruining people's impressions of Kickstarter and, like, have a serious level of backlash? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think that uh, it's reached a tipping point yet. Because, I mean, mean, look at the Kickstarters that just uh, arose out of that Sony conference. I mean, uh, Shenmue and... and, uh, 
uh, Bloodstained right before Shenmue. So there, people still do have faith in Kickstarter, but eventually if enough bad Kickstarter-related things happen at once, I wouldn't be surprised if there, if the backlash was so great that it, you know, Kickstarter funding for games just dropped like a rock. But we aren't there yet. Yeah, I, I don't know that we'll ever get there, just because there's bad projects ev- everywhere, and there are so many successful Kickstarters that I feel like as long as... You know, I think I actually, and I could this. I, I have no basis for this other than I got a feeling, but I feel like actually these failed ones and these ones that are super shady will actually cause the good ones to be even more on the up and up, and to really make sure that they're covering these things and like being honest and planning out what they're doing better. Um, you know, yeah. Be but I think I'd like to be. I ready. think games are kind of unique in that they're extra susceptible to like nostalgia, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's easier to exploit. Yeah, the two that I just mentioned, Bloodstained and Shenmue, are going right for the nostalgia center of the brain. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. it, it kind of okay. breaks my heart a little bit. It it really breaks my heart because, like, I love KG and Afune, I love Mega Man, but, like, this stuff is getting nasty. Like, it, it's getting disgusting. I'm not happy about it. I'm not going to fund their Kickstarter. For them to sit there with their Red Ash Kickstarter and then suddenly say okay well now mighty number nine is going to be delayed because we are having trouble making it like yeah that's unacceptable they knew that was gonna happen yeah you guys that's like the batman thing where they announced the batman pre-orders for arkham knight and then all of a sudden after the pre-orders are all done they're like oh yeah we're gonna delay the game uh quite a bit into the summer please understand like you guys knew and i know they claim like they they swear up and down that they had no plans to get funding for red ash like from an external publisher, they were like, yeah, this happened, you know, these interactions happened, you know, yeah. in the middle of the Kickstarter. Business interactions don't happen in two weeks in which you're like, yes, I will fund your entire expensive million dollar video game. Like, there is no way that they weren't, they didn't at least know that was on the table. That should have been disclosed right. up front. That we might yeah. be seeking external funding. Yeah, it's yeah. a little gross. It was super shitty. I've never withdrawn a Kickstarter pledge before, and I did it with that. I, I agree with you. I've I have only contributed to the Bloodstained Kickstarter because I'm an idiot and decided to put a hundred dollars toward that because I was like an idiot, Rob. Oh, you put a hundred dollars on? I put a hundred dollars toward it. I was like, I love me some Igarashi Vanias. I mean, I backed it at sixty and I felt like I was going overboard. So I, I really hope Iga comes through. I, I don't want him to turn into this. You know, I, I don't want to just blame uh, Inafune, but. I really hope that Iga comes through and he's just like, okay, here we go. Like, well, also, too, Iga is more, has directed more. Like, we always forget that Inafune has directed some games, but like, even like the supposed creator of Mega Man thing, he's not the only creator of Mega exactly, Man. Exactly. Like, exactly. And I, I, from what I, I did, I was doing some reading and, I, you know, he's apparently, you know, he, he brushed up against Capcom the wrong way. It's entirely possible that he's just not good. Not that he's the main manager of the project, but. You know, maybe he's better as a creator than a, a manager, you know? Well, and there's also an element of, you know, I, I, I think I have to go every podcast bringing up the evil within, but here we go again. Uh, Shinji Mikami got so much credit for Resident Evil, and Resident Evil 4 in particular, and the original, and the remake. And then he makes The Evil Within, which was a game that has some good moments, but it, it's kind of a mess in some areas. I think people forget that it's not just one creator making these games. It's like, oh, great, Ken Levine is making another game. But well, it doesn't have the people behind him, the programmers, the people with vision, the people, you know, the auteur thing only goes so far. You need people to back it up. Yeah, well, I, I really don't enjoy auteur theory um, related to video games because there's so many moving parts in a video game that, especially with the larger the budget of the game, the more... Uh, people are involved with every line of code with it. I don't like when a game has a hundreds of millions of dollar budget and is just a huge, uh, you know, triple A game. It the effect of one person is not nearly as great. And the like the creative lead of a video game will almost never have the same level of, you know, efficacy or auteurism than the right than the director or even the screenwriter of a film. So I don't think auteur theory holds up as well for video games once you get to a certain level of team size that's an interesting discussion i'm not sure i 100 percent agree but i partially agree well, like keep going keep going well so i would argue that you could make the exact same comment about a film because you have all the people involved with the construction of a scene you have your people building the set you have your actors you have you know they're all being directed by the director but you could argue that's the same thing somebody like miyamoto does when he's like 
you should make Mario's jump feel like this, or you should make these guys pop in a different way. Like, I, I, well, now, I don't agree because I, you know, programming is not a similar art to putting together a scene or composing a shot. But I don't know. I, I, I sort of feel like you have equally as many hands. But then the reason I sort of want to agree is then you could say auteur theory just doesn't apply to film either because... Well, l let me try to jump in there a little bit. I think that I, I agree with what you're trying to say, Stephen. But at the end of the day, after everything's been filmed for like, let's take a, a big budget sci-fi epic. Let's take, you know, Mad Max or Interstellar or something along those lines. Eventually, it all boils down to the director and the editor. And they are now going to assemble the film in such a way to tell a story and tell a narrative. If you look at the original cut for Star Wars, you know, the original 1977 movie... That movie's a mess. Like, the original cut of that movie is just a train wreck. And then the editor got in there and actually created something, you know, one of the greatest epics of our time. Mad Max, you know, Tom Hardy was saying how frustrated he was making Mad Max Fury Road because he couldn't see what the director was going for. And he actually, at like the most recent Comic-Con, he turned to the director and said, I'm really sorry I was such a jerk on the set because I didn't realize what you were going for. Then you guys went behind the scenes, worked on the movie for almost a year and a half in the editing room, and we got something that is just absolutely bananas. So I think there is an element of like a little bit of that auteur theory that's a little different from video games versus movies because the director can get in there and either build something incredible or they can almost destroy it themselves just by the way that they edit the entire film together. Whereas with a video game, you have all these moving parts that everything comes together, but they're all different pieces coming together, if that makes sense. I think it all, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I think it really depends on who your director slash lead is. You know, some people keep closer tabs on individual parts of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess it would just depend on, you know, like most things, I guess, you know, it depends on the situation. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, like, you know, yeah, like, I, I agree with the point you made earlier. Like, Mikami gets credited for a lot of these games, but, like, <laughs> Hideki Kamiya probably has more to do with Resident Evil 2 than Mikami. Oh, yeah, and Resident like, Evil 2 is fantastic. And can we talk about it? Mm, it's not it's not an rpg but we can talk RPG. about it it's I, it's, made end of discussion it's, it's my damn show I'm, I'm saying we can talk about it <laughs> resident resident evil 2 remake it's happening i am i am so happy i i can't believe it's happening i i was really worried of the nightmare scenario of eh, resident evil zero comes out and sucks and then doesn't sell a whole lot of copies and they say well nobody likes resident evil anymore they're doing it they're doing a resident evil 2 remake i want to replay resident evil 2 right now where's my vita Where, where's my vita i need to replay it but that's neither here nor there. So that's the end of Rob today. Is that a <laughs> is that uh, is that more of the kind of I, we've gotten so much flack from you know so many people talking about all the remakes and how that's all that's happening in video games right now is nothing but remakes, 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 remakes. Are there some remakes that we're just okay with? You know, like, I, I do not understand. Like there was so much complaining on Capcom's Facebook page when they announced that. Just to use that as an example, not that what as an evil. People like, oh my god, more remakes, make a new game, blah, blah, blah. like, you know, make Resident Evil 3, and I'm like, I really feel like people are confusing a complete remake with an HD remaster. Yeah, like, this is not going to be Final an Fantasy 12, <laughs> when uh, Arnie Roth said they're remaking it, everybody in the world should have known he's not talking about a remake of Final Fantasy 12, because A, that's never going to happen. No. And B... It doesn't have to happen. Yeah, like, <laughs> I just, I feel like there's this weird confluence of people are just... They hear remake and they're like, "Oh, another another remaster." It's like, "No, this is a remake." Well, and Resident Evil Two remake. I don't understand how people are complaining because after the first remake came out, everybody wanted to remade. And yeah, everybody still wanted it, and then they finally said yes, and then they're like, "Oh, remake." Well, and and you had all this backlash over the Final Fantasy VII remake, and it was like you guys do realize people were bitching and moaning about this thing for the better part of ten years, ever since they saw Cloud jump off a train using the PlayStation Three engine. Like, people wanted this remake, and now they're doing it. And, of course, now people are going to complain, because it's the internet, and nobody posts positive things. Some people are never happy. Yeah. Uh, this is why we can't have nice things. Yes. So Speaking, put, me in the, put me in the camp of I don't mind remakes. I, I don't mind as long as... I, I think some remakes are going too far. I don't think we... Okay, not remake, but HD remaster. I don't think we needed Prototype 1 and 2 <laughs> HD remastered playing worse performance-wise than the original games. Right, That's yeah. a little bizarre. That is right. a little bizarre. Execution matters a lot too, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like Silent Hill Collection was a <laughs> way to ruin that franchise. Although now they're making pachinko machines for Silent Hill. Fun, I'm gonna get upset. 
can't talk well, about Konami right now. Well, speaking of Final Fantasy VII remakes and legality, Jesse, do you want to talk about the Final <laughs> Fantasy VII side-scrolling uh, beat-em-up? Yeah, that the, it's like this weird thing that I forget what the the actual company was, some indie company that's making a side-scrolling beat-em-up for the Wii U. But they just they just released for the Wii U. No, not this Final Fantasy VII one. They're making oh, okay. another game, and so they have this. The out of, out of nowhere, they're like, "We're making a Final Fantasy VII reimagining as a side scroller beat 'em up." Um, and it actually looks. I mean, the art looks cool. Like it looks cool. I tried to I tried to download the uh, the demo, but it it wasn't working for me. But yeah, it's... the the Chrome version, the internet version didn't work for me because they said it doesn't support Chrome, which. Huh. No yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, I mean, that's... Chrome is not a supported browser, and I was like, I'm not a supported player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's been like lots of problems so far, but the point is that in their press release, they're like, this is a this is a 100 like nonprofit fan made game, right? And it, it it always bugs me as a lawyer, and it probably doesn't bug anyone else, but I'm just gonna <laughs> sort of go off on this, and that people think that like you can make copies and just like like they're they're just blatantly violating Square Enix's copyright and trademark and people think that like oh I'm going to do this and it's going to be non-profit therefore I can just do it and that's the, like, that that's not the case that's and not how that works it's not how it works right like you're you're still ripping off their property um, and they have an obligation to police their IP like if they don't enforce it, they will lose. They will lose the protection. So like they're going to come after you. It's not, well, especially when you announce it. Like that, that. Uh, I vaguely recall, like when uh, Mohang Scrolls came out and Bethesda right. had to pursue litigation, and like if nobody seemed that interested in the in the case, and they said if we don't pursue this, we will lose the right to to pursue it in the future. So like yeah. it's, it's it's an interesting argument. So- and for that, they basically had to have a legal precedent started for what constitutes and what doesn't constitute a misuse of the Elder Scrolls name or something. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, Jesse obviously has it right. There def- there's definitely going to be a cease and desist order or something on this FF7 beat em up soon, which is a shame because, like, Final Fight Fantasy VII sounds kind of <laughs> interesting. But Can you, can you uh, find turkey legs inside of barrels? Okay. This is important. Chocobo legs, Rob. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that terrible! Great. Why would you eat chocobos? Yeah, tell that to half the side quests in Final Fantasy fourteen Heavensward. Oh, really? Right? Yeah. Uh, There's an oh, entire God. arc where you're murdering chocobos, and I'm like, I'm not okay with this. Oh, this, yeah. that's terrifying. Why would it's you do pretty that? Pretty delicious. There's, I don't a, know. there's a quest in fourteen where it's you like uh, help a guy rescue a, a chocobo hatchling, and then the hatchling is is captured by a poacher, and he kills it and eats it. Oh, well, he no. kills it. He kills it, and then the NPC that's assisting you is like, "Well, it's already dead, so I should honor its its life by eating it." No, this is t- no. That makes sense to me. That's how I feel about family members too. What? No, it, I yeah. am not okay with any of this. Eat him. Done. Anywho. Um, anyhow, so run. Let's let's eat his haunches. <laughs> you know, you fry those puppies up. That sounds like there's a lot of meat on them. <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> I am not okay with any of this. Hey, guys, I got to interject real quick. Uh, D23 is happening right now, and the Kingdom Hearts panel starts in about 50 minutes, and I'm really excited about that. Oh, you shouldn't be, because they're not going to announce anything, and they're not going to show Kingdom Hearts 3. They so. might, they might show like what a they said they were going to announce something here. It's, it's a Kingdom Hearts panel. so It's like... an announcement of an announcement. Ooh, please, please look forward to it. <laughs> I the actually never gets old. World. What? I think they're going to announce a new world. Yeah, that's what I think, too. Now uh, now that I have my, my lawyer here, I'm going to ask Jesse a question. So enlighten us a little bit. Enlighten the layman. When it comes to things like Dragon Ball Z abridged, why is that okay? Is that because it is um, parody? Is that why that's okay versus the Final Fantasy VII beat-em-up? Uh, I'm not familiar with Dragon Ball Z abridged. So that's um, the that's the fan-made, like kind of voiceover we're gonna make fun of dragon ball z and go through the entire story but we're we're having fun and it's very referential humor like kind of family guy-ish in places like can't i just mind crush him 
and, and they're going and they're going they're actually using the original animation from Dragon Ball Z, but mm-hmm. they've gotten the blessing from Funimation. They're totally okay with it. Some of the voice actors for Dragon Ball Z abridged are actually in the latest Dragon Ball Z Resurrection of F movie. Like is that just Funimation being completely different and okay with it, or is it because it's parody? Um, well, it's sort of both. So you can the whoever owns the copyright can can grant or license the ability to make a copy or, or a derivative work, right? But it, it, they're also in a better position because it's a parody. Okay, this is like why Saturday Night Live doesn't get uh, sued and stuff like that. I think it also helps that DBZ Abridged is a show that's not being sold. And if, if they were selling it as a product or making ah. money off of it in a more obvious way, then there would be more problems. But it's, you know, being a YouTube show that presumably doesn't make a lot of money also helps their case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, making money would make it worse. But as we've already kind of gone over, you you can be nonprofit and it's still violating copyright. Right. I'm learning. It affects, isn't it because like they could argue that it affects awareness of the brand? Well, being able to make money off of you know the the whatever it is is only one of that we call it the bundle of rights that are in copyright, and that's only one of them. So it's not just about making money that you know is the deciding factor of whether or not it violates copyright. We need more lawyers yes. on this show. This get... is all very interesting. I was about to say, I need to get into a profession so I can know about something and talk about <laughs> You're going to be a localizer, you, you dude. You know about Shut things. Up. I know about things. You're going to know, know about things are. What, when does my physics knowledge ever come into use around here? Like, well, seriously. Apparently it comes into you breaking every game you touch. Oh, my oh. God. We've yeah, I know. For like an hour and Rob broke it more times than in my 65-hour <laughs> playthrough. I believe right. that so much. Glitch, glitch. Yeah, we you tried to load the game right after the character creator, and it just crashed. The second mistake was all you? your fault. The second like, mistake was game, all your fault. His game crashed and broke mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second time wasn't a glitch. That was my fault. They patched in a thing where you can make your game private, and it defaults to off. So every time we were loading, Rob's like, I can't join your game, and I was getting really angry. And it's because of- <laughs> <laughs> it spent like 40 minutes trying to figure this out. <laughs> oh, uh, man. That's your new cu- career. You need to go into QA. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Like, my students have asked me, like, hey, wouldn't you want to work on games? I'm like, yeah, I'd be starting out in QA, and I'd want to kill myself. They're like, why would you Why would you have a problem with that? I would be going around Grand Theft Auto just testing walls to see if I could fall through them. You'd it jump would, a million times into a wall. It would be terrifying. It would be terrible. Oy. How is that different than what you already do? That is true. <laughs> that I just I, The glitch lich is strong with this one. Who else has games to talk about? things and games and stuff well i uh I, I don't know if i mentioned this actually or not i guess i did at the beginning of this podcast but um so i've been playing mother three recently i live in tucson arizona and a couple of weeks ago we had camp fan gamer here um if you're familiar with fan gamer they're like a video game merch company they sell like t-shirts and memorabilia posters all that kind of stuff but they started out um, primarily doing stuff for earthbound and weirdly enough, they're actually based out of Tucson, Arizona, and what the hell else is here other than, like, me and the University of Arizona? I don't know. Heat yeah, Heat. And, Heat and John McCain. Heat and death. Uh, that's, yeah, that's so... John McCain. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Topical uh, humor! <laughs> so it's like, so they, they actually are based here. They don't have, like, a store that you can go to, but they have their offices here. And so they held Camp Fan Gamer, which is the first ever Earthbound fan convention. And I went to it a few weeks ago. It was just held at a a Hilton hotel here. Um, It was surprisingly populated. I guess I didn't expect very many people to show, but there were like a good 500 people there. Um, They had panels. They had art contests, video contests, all kinds of cool stuff. And it was just a neat place to go and celebrate uh, Earthbound fandom. So since I'm such a big fan. What? You should never underestimate that that Earthbound fandom because, I mean, just look at um, the reach and and uh, dedication of the people at Starman.net. Like, Earthbound fans do not mess around. I'm not surprised that people would travel for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, when I showed up, because for me, it was like 15 minutes away, so it was a no-brainer, but I saw cars in the parking lot from all over the country, and I was like, wow, people really care, which is cool. I mean, they're dedicated. So uh, after all of that, I was super, I was in my Earthbound-y kind of mood, and I realized that I still hadn't beaten Mother 3, um, I had started up the fan translation years ago, and I got to, like, chapter four. 
And uh, <clears throat> so I was like, all right, you know what? It's time. Fine, I'll do it. So I restarted a playthrough of it, and I've been um, being really anal retentive about like talking to every NPC a million times and all that. Um, I bought the Mother 3 handbook when Fangamer released it back in 2000. Let's see, I have the copyright date here. Was it like six or nine? I don't know. Uh, 2000, 2009 is when the guide came out. The game came out in 06. So I've had this book sitting on my shelf, and I have been terrified of looking at it for fear of having everything spoiled. So I was like, you know what? It's time. So yeah, I've been playing Mother 3. Um, game holds up incredibly well. I'm in Chapter 7 out of 8, so I'm pretty far along. It's, uh, it's really amazing how... I mean, like I, I know a lot of it has to do with the original script, sure. But the tone of the fan translation is so in line with Earthbound's localization. And it's one of those games where you actively seek out NPCs to speak to because you want to see what they're going to say. Like, it's, it's, it's all contributing to this really kind of warm, fuzzy sense of, of like, a, an alive world that has its own strange, quirky sense of humor. And besides that, Mother 3 is a game that is really funny and really offbeat, but really sad and so messed up in a lot of ways. Like a lot of major characters die and they don't pretend like they haven't died. It's just yeah, like, I, oh yeah, they're dead. I've actually beaten Mother 3. It's the only Earthbound game I've beaten from start to finish. Uh -huh. Only Mother game. And like, I, I actually like 3 better than Earthbound. I mean, again, I've only played the beginning and the final boss of Earthbound. But Mother 3, you're right, has... It seems so light. Like, it seems like there's a lot of levity and there is, but it's also like... I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a lot in that game that is morbidly depressing. Yeah. And not in like a, oh, something sad happened. It's like, no, something sad happened, and you are going to suffer from existential dread for the rest of your existence. <laughs> it's the kind of game that actually makes you think a lot, and it's not what you expect when you see the bright, colorful uh, graphics and, like, the happy-go-lucky music that, that pops up. And there's also some really melancholy stuff, like... It's a surprisingly emotional and effective game. Uh, and I've, I've really enjoyed the playthrough of it so far. And it, like, it also just holds up really well. It's just a fun RPG. It's got a cool rhythm mechanic in the battle system that I think we were mentioning earlier. It's kind of off on emulators. So I'd recommend... Yeah, that's, like, that's why I stopped playing, playing it. Yeah, well, but... They released... What was it? The original Mother a couple months ago? Uh -huh. Was that on Wii U Virtual yeah. Console? Yeah. I, I actually think the original Mother is a bad game. and But... Yeah. Uh, Especially as in the latter portions of it, the like the team there wanted to make, you know, basically a Dragon Quest clone, basically a simple RPG, but with this unusual world and tone and sort of plot idea. And the the plot stuff is actually pretty interesting. Reading a wiki article about Mother One is an interesting experience, but actually playing it is miserable because the last couple dungeons, like enemies will one shot you regardless of how much you level. It's, oh, that sounds like my kind of game. Right there's there. actually there's it's a patch BS. actually like a rebalancing patch that people made because that game is so intolerably grindy and hard. It needs one. I just I just want a patch for that game that makes all the enemies the hippie. <laughs> the re the retro new age hippie. <laughs> I want a rhythm game that's nothing but monkey dances to open secret doors. Oh, cool! It's called Rhythm Heaven, and you should try it. That's a good game. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I don't really have anything else to add to it. I just I've been playing it, and I have been pleasantly surprised by how well it holds up um, thematically as well as mechanically. It's 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 a fun RPG. Like it's definitely story heavy for sure, but there are sections where you you do have to grind. Not you don't have to grind too much, but grind like a little bit. You have to re manage your items carefully. Like the battles can be challenging. It's definitely not a cakewalk, but. Uh, Highly, highly recommend it if you're an Earthbound fan and just never got around to playing it like me. I mean, it's it's out there. Go for it. And then there's also a uh, fan-developed Mother 4 coming out, which is interesting because we were just talking about copyright stuff. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work because it's being built on their own brand new engine, but it looks exactly like an Earthbound game mm. with new graphics. Um, and the, the whole it's going to be free. Like It's going to be released as a standalone program for PC. You're not going to need an emulator or anything like that. It's just like its own thing. But uh, it's scheduled to come out this year or next year, whenever it's done. So uh, I hope I hope it doesn't get CND. But at the same time, I, I guess I understand reluctantly why it would be. Nintendo will be like, we have to protect our right to do nothing with this. Give it yeah. back. I know. Just like if if they release an official localization of Mother Three, even if they license the fan translation, which is incredible, and then release that in some form, I will buy it, no questions asked. Like the. Uh... The, one of the main creators of the fan translation even said, I'll give you this translation for free. Mm -hmm. It's this game. Yeah. Uh, 
it's it's such a good game. I, I don't know why it took me so long to finally get back on it and play it, but y'all should play it. If you want to feel really sad and also laugh a lot, then I highly, highly recommend putting something inappropriate as your favorite food at the beginning of the game. Cause, oh, right. Oh, the laughs. <laughs> I've seen that. Oh, yeah, the I've, I've seen your tweets about that, but I don't think we can say what word you no, chose on this podcast. The correct answer is balls. Fantastic. That works equally well, actually. Well, now that you've said it, Oh, well, there oh, it is. A, go- a ghost burped on me, and it smelled like rotten balls. That's fantastic, guys. <laughs> Monkey guys... dances and man gypsies and skinhead and neckbeard. Oh, that game's great. You guys think there's any chance of Mother 3, like, officially coming out? I think there is. I hmm. I, I think a little bit more so now, just because uh, of the release of Earthbound Beginnings, and then they were also hyping up Lucas a lot as a, as a Smash DLC character. Mm-hmm. So now is like an okay time. It's not like Mother 3 has been irrelevant completely as of late, you know. Like it's kind of come back into the spotlight, at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. I actually wonder if they're not planning on either bundling them or remaking Earth, uh, Mother 3 and releasing it as like a 3DS title. I would scream in the best way. Be, oh my god. It's weird though, because then they would have not re-released Earthbound. So I don't know, maybe they would do a bundle with all three or something. There's well, been talk... Have- Go ahead. They have the Mother 1 and 2 GBA game in Japan, so I don't see why they couldn't do like a Mother 2 and 3 or Mother 1, 2 and 3 bundle. Yeah. Oh, but that, that reminds me of like Xenosaga episode 1 and 2 on DS that we never got. Yeah, but I mean, at least these are like the same games. They're not remakes or reimaginings, so... There was some scuttlebutt, speaking of uh, bundling games, there's been a little rumor going around that we might get the two Fire Emblem games coming out in a bundle. I wouldn't be surprised. I think hmm. that's the way they're going to have to do it. It's well, they bundling. they already have separate listings for both of them on retailers and stuff. Right, but I, I think they're going to do a bundle. Like I think both games are $40. I think they'll probably do a bundle for like maybe 60 or 70 Oh, you I, mean like I thought they I thought that was confirmed already, but I, I could be... Maybe I'm... Thinking of a bundle with the with the DLC because there's a thir- there's a, I mean, there's a third the, scenario. Yeah, there's a third scenario that uh, I thought ca- I thought came in certain bundles, but I might be imagining that. Um, but yeah, the way that it's structured, uh, a bundle of multiple scenarios or both games would make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I think we'll see that. I'm gonna give that game a shot. I'm, I'm gonna turn my brain off and just enjoy Fire Emblem for what it is and not try to play it like a tactics game. Do it, Rob! I really liked, wait, I loved the characters, but I got so fed up because it was like, normal was way too easy, and then hard just turned it into a grind fest. Like, no, yeah, they, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, I mean, like, uh... uh I, I think hard is same, fine, but I agree that normal is yeah. easy and lunatic is impossible. Yeah, yeah and the, yeah, lunatic. I couldn't remember what the name but of the highest I, difficulty was, but that thing is, don't, don't play lunatic. But all I did when I played it on hard was like, wow, this game is a hell of a lot harder. I'm just going to grind more, and that just means I'm going to play more of it and destroy it. That's like, an RPG. I was just destroying it the exact same way that I was, do- that I was doing it. It was just taking longer. Well, you can play... It, the nice thing is you can play the Black Kingdom in this upcoming one, and that you can't grind. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. See, you might like the older Fire Emblems or Black Kingdom better, Rob, because those are ones where you cannot grind. Awakening is the first one you can really grind in. Right, and that that just made the game, I, I don't know, like, I, I started to get, like, okay, instead of taking one hour to grind, I'm just going to take two hours to grind on hard mode. Huh. But on the other hand, that grinding probably also is part of the reason that Awakening sold so well. Probably. Because it made it more yeah. accessible. Because and... you can end up screwed in those old Fire Emblem games. Like, wow, I'm not going to be able to beat this fight. That sounds fun. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, one of my favorite but... things, honestly, like the limited yeah. experience and experience being a resource that you have to manage. But yeah, I, I agree. That's one of the things I like about it, too. Hmm. I don't know. I, I loved all the characters. I loved making them making babies. I should oh, probably... and Fire Emblem. Uh, yeah, that's yeah Fire, Fire Emblem. Emblem. Yeah, 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 Fire Emblem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not announcing anything on the show, guys. <laughs> not going to have our, our RPG fan baby. It's not going to happen. You mean there's happen. a chance? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not having this conversation right now. <laughs> I'm not having this conversation right now. All right, who else has games to talk about? Um, I've been playing the new King's Quest. Did I talk about that last time? No, you didn't. I want to hear about King's Quest. Um, so... I discovered on the internet recently that there is this group of people, for example, like at Rock, Paper, Shotgun, and Yahtzee, Ben Croshaw, who 
apparently have decided that the old King's Quest games are terrible because they like LucasArts games. And for those of you not aware, LucasArts old adventure games were very story heavy. There were very few fail states in them. There was not a lot of dying and failing, which you could argue is, you know, better design. I, but I grew up with King's Quest. There's fail states in that. And it's a little obtuse. Um, but so there have been some reviews of the new King's Quest that talk about how it's like the old ones and it's terrible and, you know, you just walk around clicking on stuff and solving puzzles and it's terrible. And I'm, it sort of amuses me that that's a complaint because that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an adventure game, right? Yeah. And, you know, people have gotten so inured by Telltale style, which is basically not even gameplay. It's just walk around, click on hotspots and, pers- you know, pursue the story, which is fine. But it's why I've never been quite as enamored of Telltale's games as I think the average person is, because they're not, they're about as much of a game as Heavy Rain is a game, possibly even less. Less. I'm I'm glad you brought that up, because that was going to be my next argument, but you made it for me. You know, so there's there's plenty of room for that, because a visual novel is the same thing. It's just dialogue, and, you know, there's room for that, and I think that's great. But King's Quest is not trying to be, a like, early reports made it look like it was going to be a Telltale game, but it's actually quite different. So the new King's Quest, to start off with, I like it a lot. Um, It is sort of not really a reboot because it's the same characters, but it's all like, like the the framing narrative is that King Graham, voiced by Christopher Lloyd to perfection, is old and telling his granddaughter tales of when he was a knight. And the first story he tells is the intro to the game, which is him getting the magic mirror, which is an old thing you did in King's Quest 1 from a dragon. Or no, King's Quest 2. Or 1, I can't remember, I don't know. But uh, so the intro plays a little bit like a Telltale game where it's very scripted, very linear, um, and it's basically just there to sort of teach you how to play the game. Uh, You know, the the graphics are good. There are sequences that are basically quick time events, but they're not, you know, it's not like a quick time event like, you know, this came out of nowhere. It's like, hey, I'm, you know, I fell into a waterfall and now I'm avoiding rocks. But they're sort of sparingly used. Uh, So the intro of the game is polarizing. I think it's fine, but... The game really begins with a second story after you do this intro where he's sort of telling the story back to his granddaughter and he fills in as the narrator that the series has always had. And so once the game actually starts, you're a really young King Graham before he became king and you're in a tournament and basically you are dropped into the kingdom, Daventry, and it's an old school, you know, it's basically, you know, a direct control point and click adventure game with no fail states like you can't do like you like an old king's quest 5 there was a quest where or a a sequence where you had to get meet a fortune teller and you could pay her with a gold coin you find or a golden needle you find and if you pay her with a golden needle you cannot beat the game because you need that for something later so you know there were a lot of states in the old king's quest games where you could not be able to progress and have to start over if you didn't make a lot of saves there's nothing like that in the new one there is still character death and they use it the way they did before, where it's, you know, in, in the old King's Quest, you would die in the game, and they would make, like, a joke or a pun about how you died and, like, call you stupid or something. The new one, if you die, all that happens is you get a brief piece of dialogue where, like, you know, Graham makes a joke or something, or he's like, obviously that's not what happened because I'm here. Uh, and then it just reloads you in that area. So it cuts out a lot of the potential for I lost progress, all of it, really. Um, but, you know, even though it looks different and feels different when you're moving around i really think it plays a lot like a very refined version of the old walk around get inventory items talk to people and solve puzzles king's quest games um tonally i think it's very on it's it's sort of a little bit more humorous than the old ones but it definitely gets the same sort of wry fairy tale thing going on um it's it's a lot like the princess bride i would say in terms of tone that sounds uh, good to me. The writing is outstanding. It's funny. It's charming. King, like, you know, because the series is known for bad puns. But what they've done is that not all the characters tell bad puns. Graham just tells them as he's narrating. And so his his granddaughter, like, he'll tell a bad pun. And she'll be like, oh, my God, no. You know, so they, they've sort of, they're, they're aware that the punning is sort of a quirk of the character. And they make it really charming. And, like, there are a lot of, like, references to old adventure game tropes like you get a hatchet and Graham is like oh god i picked up a hatchet and the granddaughter's like oh you used it on everything and he's like no i didn't use it on everything and every time if you try to use the wrong the hatchet on something for a puzzle he's like she's like and then you cut it with the hatchet and he's like no i didn't do that no i didn't 
And if you do it enough times, there's eventually a puzzle where he goes, and then I stuck the hatchet in the wood and never picked it up again ever because I didn't need it anymore. You know, so they sort of make fun of a lot of old tropes of adventure games where, you know, if you get a knife or a, something that's too good that could solve every puzzle, you know, it's like, why doesn't this solve every puzzle? So they sort of make fun of that. Um, there aren't quite as many items as your average King's Quest game, the old ones. There's still a fair number. Like, you know, you can have, you know, six, seven, eight items. But there's no sort of, like, obtuse inventory combination puzzles. Um, might be better, though, yeah? Like yeah, like, you know, I, my nostalgia tells me I miss that. But it's so, it, like, the old games are so obtuse in terms of sometimes what you would have to combine to do. That this one, there's, there's more logic to it. There are still some really out there puzzle solutions. But I honestly feel like that's part of the charm, is that, you know, you do something silly. Um, what's really cool about it is that even while it plays, you know, as an inventory-based, like, you know, walk-around adventure game with puzzles, there's a lot of solutions to every puzzle. And the game is sort of non-linear in that, like, you could pursue a lot of different avenues of resolving issues. And that, you know, there are little, you know, jokes later that pop up if you did things a certain way. Like, as an example, there's a picnic basket set up in a really picture picturesque scene with some bees above it. And there's fruit right next to the bees that you need. You could just shake the tree and all the fruit comes down and so do the bees and it lands on the picnic table. There's nobody there. So you're like, all right, whatever. I take the fruit and I walk away. Uh, but like way later in the storyline, you meet a character and he's covered in bee stings. And he's like, yeah, my date went really bad recently. I got stung by bees. Uh, so, and, you know, there's a lot of ways to get the fruit that you need. And the sequencing of the game is really cool because you can sort of, you know, if you opt to solve a puzzle one way early on, you might still solve another, that the other puzzle that's in your face later on, but for a different reason. So it seems like it's really replayable. I haven't quite finished it yet. Um, but I don't want to talk, you know, too overlong about it. Other than to say that I think if you are open-minded and like the old games, you'll enjoy this one. Um... It looks different. It feels a little different. But overall, the experience of playing it is, to me, what I remember it was before. It's funny. It's charming. There's, you know, sincere moments. There's cheesy moments. It's, you know, it's it's just a fun game. Well, I, I think the, the comment about, like, the modern stuff in it and kind of the lack of some of the more obtuse stuff, you said that there's still some of that in there. That's what really turned me off to Shadowgate was, like, I wanted to really like Shadowgate, but that plays, like, such an old-school game that it felt creaky. And I started to really get frustrated, like, if I don't click on everything in this room over and over again, and I can't even tell some of the stuff I can click on and rub stuff against it, I'm not going to make it, and then the game is on a timer. So every time yes. I rub something, it's taking a turn that might potentially kill me. Yeah, so there, that, that's, there's none of that in this one. You know, and again, King's Quest never had, like, a time limit or anything like that, but it did have, like, you know, if you use the wrong item on this puzzle, it will work, but in two hours, you will be unable to solve a puzzle. There's none of that in this. You cannot possibly fail. There's, I would say, in my opinion, there's just the right amount of, like, sort of quirky solutions to stuff, while there's still plenty of very clear, I know what I need to do here, but the question is, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's very respectable, uh, respectful of its old material and even referential and sometimes joking about it. But it has an, it's modern enough that it doesn't get in the way of the player and uh, maybe is more accessible than those old games as well. Yeah, definitely more accessible. I would say I don't envy the task they had, but I think they, they did it admirably. As a fan of the old ones, I acknowledge that there's no way you could make a game like, the, like King's Quest VI anymore because it just it wouldn't be it, it would be too much for most people. Uh, this one, I think, is a good concession to both. They haven't watered anything down. They've just sort of built a different style that feels spiritually like the old ones. Um, and, you know, there, it is very, like, there are a ton of references to the old games. Like, you know, the inventory item, when you pick up pick stuff up, the, the same it's the same sound effect from King's Quest VI. There's a ton of audio and musical cues that are from the old games or that call back to the old games. There's lots of, you know, jokes and references to stuff that's going, like... Since Graham is young in the game, they make a lot of jokes that will apply in the future of his life that you would only know if you've played the other games. Um, and the uh, one of the best jokes in the entire game, uh, you have to get these rabbits or these squirrels away from a pumpkin because you're trying to pick it up and they keep like jumping on you when you do. When you finally scare the squirrels away, you pick it up and the granddaughter goes, will the squirrels remember that? And Graham goes, oh, the squirrels will definitely remember that. <laughs> so they, See, I they, like that. They poke a lot of they don't they they're they're not mocking, but they poke a lot of fun at like Telltale's adventure games. So 
there it's very very self-aware and modern and even anachronistic in some of the dialogue but that's that's part of that series so it works well this is a series that, whose second game was medieval and took place in a castle and a fairy tale countryside and had the batmobile driving around so the, it fits the tone quite well and the voice acting is incredibly good so jesse how would that work out in legal terms with the batmobile driving around in a king's quest game today <laughs> um if it's parody it you know it'd be What's that, Caitlin? If they have the rights to it. Yeah, if they license it, right, there's no problem. You can right, always buy course. the rights. Um, it, you know, honestly, it would probably have to go to a court to, to figure Jesus. it out, which is, which is one of the problems with copyright. You know, it's like you got to have a court kind of sort everything out for you. Yeah. It's hard to know the rights in advance. It's really nebulous. Mm. But yeah, I think, I, I, I think it's very accessible and I it's very charming and... Some people have complained that it's too Princess Bride compared to the old ones, and that's I could see that, but that's not something I'm willing to get upset about. That's a selling point. As far I would yeah, agree. I, I think it's 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 pretty great, and it's even got Wallace Shawn in it as a character, so it really feels Princess Bridey. So, would you say that for someone who's never played any of the old King's Quest, is this a good game to? wet teeth on oh absolutely i think it's a good game on its own i don't think you need any nostalgia for the old ones because the nostalgia is very subtle um you know it's there and it makes you happy when you see it and it fits well like they refer to other kingdoms that you don't go to in this game that are referred to in the other series so it's very it's clear that they understood that they had to make a new game not a game that depended on the old ones for its existence all right I, I'm interested in it, but I think I'm probably going to do this the same way I do the other, uh, the Telltale games, which is to wait until there's more episodes available. I don't like waiting no. for content. I know you disagree with me on that, but well, no, I in Telltale, I I I appreciate your position. In this one, they're calling them chapters, and I wouldn't say it's episodic because the storyline completes in this game. Mm, okay, everyone is its own storyline story from Graham's past. So, like, this one is just how he became a knight, and, like, it has a resolution, and it ends, um, you know, and it's also quite a bit longer than your average Telltale game. I mean, I have about eight hours on it, and I would say probably, you know, you're going to get seven or eight hours out of this episode. Wow, so. and this is one out of five chapters, like a yes. Telltale game? Wow. Or no, huh. four chapters, and then a, or four or five, and then an epilogue. That's pretty so respectable. That's, that's yeah. pretty meaty if the other ones are about the same length and in level of involvement than the first one, as the first yeah, one. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, you know, it's hard for me to sort of get into a Telltale game sometimes because either I'm playing one chapter, which is very short and very, like, you know, I, I finished it in one sitting and then it's months before I play another one, or it's, you know, I, I, I barrel, I marathon the whole series and it's just like, you know, you don't get too attached to any one location or any one set of objects or puzzles or scenarios because it's going to be gone so quickly. Whereas here, you really have the time to just, you go into Daventry and there's a lot of different places to explore. Like, I was expecting like four or five screens Back to the Future style, the Back to the Future adventure game. Right. Uh, but it's not really like that at all. It's very much like, there's like, you know, about 20, 25 places you can go. Uh, and more and more keep opening up. It's very big. So I would say it does not feel like an episodic game. But um, by extension, uh, do we know when episode two is coming out? Because if it's you know every six months or every year, it would still feel like really separate chapters that Rob might not prefer to experience them like that, that far mm -hmm. apart. I think, I don't know, I think they said like a month or two. Uh, something about mid, late summer or like September or something. Um but yeah, you know, since they're all discrete stories, it, it's better to think maybe they're all sort of like old King's Quest games where they're like the same character in a different situation. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to... It sort of depends on where they go with the next one. But it sounds like you like it. I definitely do. Um, I think it's great. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, but it's what it needs to be, I think. Uh -huh. Well, it's definitely a franchise that hadn't had an entry in how long? I think almost 20 years. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of awesome that they got a chance to do this. Yeah, I think I think 1998 was the last one, uh, Mask of Eternity, which was not very much like the other ones anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, if you have, I would I would say it's I recommend it to basically anybody who enjoys something that's lighthearted and fun, but also occasionally heartfelt. So haters are gonna hate, but you like it. 
Yeah, well, I think the problem is any any reboot of an old series, you get the people who were young kids when they played the old ones, and now everything that's different is terrible and it sucks, and why would they do this even though there's only ten of us? Mm -hmm. Right. Those people tend to be the loudest on the internet. Yeah, yeah and that's... not the ones that make make money for games. That is That is true. Well, what else do we have to talk about? The Kingdom Hearts uh, panel is uh, accidentally flashed a slideshow. It hasn't started yet, but apparently they showed. So it's a Disney interactive panel, and apparently they accidentally played their slideshow, and people caught shots of Kingdom Hearts slides. So they're saying something about Kingdom Hearts. But they I know they're going to say something. So, uh, Mike, you were going to say something about the Trails in the Sky second chapter thing? Exactly. Uh, on Friday, Exceed put a second post on their Trails in the, Squ in the Sky localization blog. It's the first one they had done in something like a month and a half or two months. And as a fan who would love to play Trails in the Sky, Sky second chapter as soon as possible, it was really a bummer because the whole post was about how buggy and difficult the localization process has been. <laughs> right. It's... Yeah. Um, I mean, you probably heard the story of several weeks ago how there were so many lines of code in the uh, in their master document that it crashed two computers. Uh, it's about 90,000 lines, which is three times as many as uh, they had for Story of Seasons earlier this year. And just, it's a disaster. There's words that are randomly enlarging, doors that are bright glowing, bright blue but can't be opened uh um invisible Ball, glowing balls coming out of people's backsides yes in invisible well, invisible enemies visible enemies that aren't there just all kinds of Jeez. crazy stuff so they have their internal q a studio and they hired a second q a studio to do nothing but work on cleaning that game up but it's uncertain when it'll be ready but they are dedicated to finishing it thank goodness yeah, and it's been it's been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, and they haven't given a hard release date for a long time. And it's so, on one hand, like, I, I commend them for putting all of that out there and for explaining why it's taking so long and talking about the problems that they're having in depth. Um, on the other hand, it just sucks as somebody who wants the game to be out. You know, it's like, I, I was really bummed reading that article because at the end of it, it was like, you know, it's been a long few months and just maybe in a couple more months, we'll be able to finally release it. And it's like, really? A couple more months? Ugh! And before all of this, I mean, I don't know if this was discussed on the podcast, but uh, one of the people at Carpe Fulger, the localization group that uh, was working alongside Exceed, had some very serious personal problems earlier this year that set back the translation of the game several months. So this this game has had, it's been through localization hell, and I'm sure that Exceed would love for it to be finished right, as soon as yeah. possible. Hmm. But like it's, more than it's, anything, it's... I I wish for the wellness of all the people oh, working yes. on the project, and I, I would never put the game before anybody's mental or physical well-being. It's just it's just frustrating, as you know, like the game. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't implying that either. It's just I just, oh, I, know to, you were. I, I just wanted to make it clear that this game has had some difficulties in the localization process, but you know, hopefully that everyone will make it through safe and sane, and we'll be playing this eventually. No, in other words, really. when this game comes out, you better buy it. I, really I hope think so, yeah. I think it's extremely likely that we get Trails of Cold Steel Part One before Trails in the Sky Part uh -huh. Two. Yeah, and before they had said that that they fully intended on releasing second chapter before Cold Steel, but yeah, it's it's going to be weird because we're going to technically be playing the sixth game in the series before the second one ever comes out. And Ooh. I know that one of the playable characters in in because uh, Cold Steel takes place in a military academy, and one of the main characters in Trails in the Sky is like the. Uh, is a nobleman that's like the principal of the military academy. So guess what? He survives that game. It's minor spoiler. <laughs> it's good to know these things. Yeah, but it's yeah, it, it's really a mess. I just I'd really like to be able to play that game, but it looks like it's not in the cards in the immediate future. Huh. Yeah, I was just googling the release date the other day, like kind of hoping that would be <laughs> that would be out or there'd be some news, but. Yeah, so it looks like we've got a couple more months to go. They initially projected summer. Well, I mean, their most recent projection was just summer. Um, and I had hoped it would be out before the semester started so I could really dig in. But, I mean, it's, it's all me, me, me. It has to suit my schedule. Oh. No, but seriously, like, I, I actually hope it Come it on, man, this, this isn't Reddit. I know, right? 
So this year, maybe we'll get. Um, they've actually been doing voice recording for Trails of Cold Steel, and they just wrapped that up after a month of doing that. And I guess it went really well, um, according to their Twitter and the people I follow from Exceed, like their independent Twitters. They said it's been a lot of fun, and they're really happy with how the the voice work turned out for the dub. So uh, we'll get Trails this year. I mean, if you like your traditional RPGs, then then you'll be you'll be satisfied. All right, but just not second chapter. Okay, what else do we have? Or are we ready to start moving on into the news? I don't really... Again, I'm playing the same stuff for old games, so I don't really have any like new stuff to talk about. There okay. was some news about the game that you and I are currently playing right now, Robert, as in this, as in this second. Oh, you want to talk about Diablo, huh? It won't be long. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am not going to stop you. All right, they're starting Season 4 of... Uh, of Diablo play. They're adding something called the Kanai Cube, which is similar to the Haradric Cube, and it's but it's named after uh, a deceased Blizzard employee, Kevin Kanai. And it's you're going to be able to basically farm legendary items and equip their affixes onto new equipment slots, which sounds crazy. Yeah. Or, so, yeah. Or, like. <laughs> so so it's, you won't. Everyone won't need a Ring of Royal Grandeur if they want multiple set bonuses. You can just eat a, like, sacrifice a ring and then equip that legendary bonus. Or the same yeah. thing for I- items like the Furnace or uh, that, that crazy monk Daibo that gives you, you know, double attack speed. Um, well, I think it, it's not, you don't put it on an item. You you have yeah, three yes. slots for, for passive abilities. Yeah, you sacrifice the item and then you get that ability for a slot. Yeah, so, like, it's going to basically explode build options because you're going to be able, you won't have to, like, you know, you, you have your set items, and you don't have to unequip or break your set in order to get some really great effect from a weapon. Uh, in other words, it's like they're adding three new torment level of difficulties, like three harder difficulties. Because I thought it was seven. I thought they're going up to ten. Uh, no, it's. Uh, I think they're going up to ten. So they're adding yeah. five levels of torment because they are six. insane. Well, because now you're with these new abilities, your your damage is going to go up exponentially you're going to go from you know two million damage to 10 million so they have to add you know they're adding new items you know the usual stuff it's new new legendaries new sets they're tweaking effects changing a few skills they're adding a new area to the game uh it's just at this point if you are hating on diablo 3 you are based you have not played the game in three years yeah and oh it's and not, also they're it's uh... not diablo 2 but i'm having probably more fun now with it than i did with diablo 2 i would agree uh, I think I think Torchlight Two is a better Diablo Two, and Diablo Three is a totally new thing that's better than Torchlight Two. And I say this as someone that adores Torchlight Two. It, it, no, yeah, absolutely. Diablo Two is a great game, and Torchlight Two is a great retread of similar ground. So if you just cannot handle a new style of action RPG, clicky, 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 that you know that's t- totally fine. You can play Torchlight. Diablo 3, and we, Rob, we've been saying this since the get-go, this is not meant to be Diablo 2. This exactly. is a new game. It was broken when it came out, and, not, and you know, it was fun, sort of, but it is well, I think it was, it was better now. They keep making it better. It's just super fun to play. It feels good, and there's so much build diversity now with none of the grindy, oh, I screwed up my character, I better start a new one type of thing. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it had problems when it came out, but it was still a good game. Like, I, I'm not going to revisionist history the game. I I loved it. But it has just gotten ridiculous now. Like, th- this game is just stupid nuts now. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm almost fun. on the flip side. I didn't like it as much when without the expansion and, and was hesitant to get the expansion. But when I finally did a month or two ago, it's it's been amazing. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's my loot grind item game of choice for the maybe forever i don't know it sounds like me and final fantasy 14 <laughs> right yeah like, like i've got every like you know i play every season for about 50 hours and you know i stop but then you know every season comes around and i've started new characters and i never do that you know and it's just fun to level up and then it's fun to hunt for rare items because you just get so strong and you're like you start out you're like poking people and you can't do anything and then you're warping around doing 10,000 percent damage killing everything on screen in like a matter of seconds it's awesome yeah it's, oh and they also uh, announced some things like uh crossover content with uh heroes of the storm blizzards moba and uh 
Um, in fact, I think there's items named after Heroes of the Storm characters. Oh, it's, really? I didn't hear about that. Yeah, like like there's gonna be a like a Vala's crossbow and a like oh, cool. a, and I think a knife named after Nazi bow, like things like that. But um, and if you uh, get to level seventy in season four, you get Diablo for free in Heroes of the Storm. Just really? And, yeah, and just uh, oh, things like yeah. that. Because normally Diablo is like six bucks paying money or seven thousand gold playing uh, just getting a lot of golden heroes but there's a lot of little crossover things they're planning it's they got the blizzard machine going it's diablo 3 is really fun it is really fun and i think uh, steven you're 100 percent right it, it is not diablo 2 but you know what that is okay i am yeah, more than know, okay I, with like, that I'm, again i know a lot of the i i can hear the complaints in my head that people still have oh it's required that i'm online it, every online game is like that now yeah, it's an online and, game. That's what it is. And, and, you know, I know people like to say Diablo 1 and 2 weren't online games, and you're absolutely right. I think Diablo 2 was meant to be played online. Diablo 3 is not an offline game. You can play the campaign, but Diablo 3 is not meant to be a game you play the campaign in. You go into adventure mode, you kill monsters a thousand times over in sewers that turn into towers, and you get swords that light up the sky and blow things up. Yep, and, and things blow up real pretty. I'm playing as a wizard right now, and good lord, Jeebus. That damage output is just ridiculous. Oh, I love this game. I just killed a Rift Guardian <laughs> with a Conduit Pylon, and I feel great about life right now. It was funny, I, I was playing a little bit of Diablo 3 with the wife on console, and I was having a hard time as a demon hunter. Like, something really weird went on where, like, I ran into two elites early in the game, still on normal mode, hadn't even found any equipment yet, and I just could not kill them. I was like, what is going... Like, again, I just broke the game. I just broke the game. I ran into a situation that on normal that I couldn't beat. I don't understand you. I don't either. I don't how do you either. work? I'm just... I, I, I don't know how I break video games, dude. It just happens. Did I break any games at E3? I don't think I did. I think the only thing I ever broke at E3 was Metal Gear Rising. Yeah, but that's because it's not a very good game. I Shut mean, that's, up. That's a great game. No, it's not. It is. <laughs> no, it's really not. No, it really is. It's you another just, bad You don't know how to play game. it. No, it's another bad platinum all. game. You're you full are, of you crap. Are, you are falling <laughs> the game for your inability to control that it. That camera is atrocious. Not according to all the people who have no problem playing it. Oh, yeah, you, the same people that said that the Kingdom Hearts camera was great. Nobody says that except for me. <laughs> I want them to make a Vanquish 2. I loved Vanquish. I think I wanted to like Vanquish. It's weird, but I think it's great. I love that. I didn't play enough of it. Played it all. Can't you, like, run and slide a lot? Ooh. I think there's a lot of smoking in that game, isn't there? Like, the dude is always smoking. He's like Dojima. I just got a really dope amulet. Awesome. We could could just sit here talking about Diablo all day. Do we want to move into news? Sure. Um, can I really quickly go over... No, uh, Jesse, absolutely oh, not! Oh, I had my time, and now uh, I can't of talk. Of course huh? you can. What do you want to um, talk about, sir? Right, I went and played uh, Bloodgate Age of Alchemy at the DNA office, whatever. You know, this this, this freemium thing. mobile game. Thing with the things. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's basically Puzzle Fighter, but it's like fantasy, and, and you can... And go on... Yeah, so <laughs> see, I got someone's attention. So it's like a, it's like Puzzle Fighter, but with I don't know, um, what's that gems game? You you Bejeweled? swipe, jewel. Bejeweled. Bejeweled. One of those. Oh, so it's, so it's like a match three with Puzzle Fighter. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Puzzle Quest. So maybe kinda, Puzzle Quest, awesome. sorta. Yeah, Puzzle Quest is fun. Maybe it's Puzzle Quest. I never played Puzzle Quest. Oh my gosh, Puzzle Quest is amazing. The first don't one. play don't play the PSP version. That game's that game's really bugged, but it's it's a really really good game in general. Okay, okay. Um, so the point is, it's this like fun little you know freemium puzzle quest puzzle fighter thing. Um, and it's actually pretty well executed. Like I, I I was in I was actually enjoying myself, you know, connecting the swipes and. Hitting the bombs and doing the doing the whatever, killing the monsters. Um, but really, what I wanted to talk about was just you know, you can tell how they put all these all these components into the game just to monetize it, right? Because it's a uh, freemium game, right? So and and I'm talking to the guy and he's going like, 
oh, like this is so great. You can you can get keys from monster drops, and then you can use them on these chests, and you can unlock a chest, and it'll have random items. And like, isn't this so cool that it'll have a random item drop out of the chest? And I'm thinking, like, no, that's not. That that's sounds not like cool. Team Fortress Two crates or Dota chests, and that's not appealing to me. Yeah, like a, that's a basic like, mechanic of a, a role playing game, like. Exactly, and it, one, it's it's hardly revolutionary, and two, it's very obvious that they're doing it so they can sell you, you know, gems or whatever the in-game currency yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It like, it's fun, but it really just spoke to the the problems that I have with freemium games and and that whole revenue model. Yeah, and you know, it, it must be tough as a developer of that to have to go and talk to people and explain something that is not a feature, it's a money-making device, mm -hmm. as if it's a feature. Like, it's sort of like that Adventure Time puzzle quest that should have printed money, and I'm sure it will, but it's literally like, my roommate was playing it, and uh, like, you know, it's the kind of, you know, mobile game where you get different characters and you need slots for your characters, mm -hmm. and it like forces you to buy a character with the currency that costs actual money, Mm -hmm. Like they give you like we gave you some free currency, which we're going to force you to spend and then we're going to force you to spend more of it on a character slot. What a great feature. Mm. It's, just, it's the same thing problem I have with free to play MMOs in that unlike Final Fantasy 14, they're not built to be a cohesive experience. They're built to be compartmentalized so they can monetize as much of it as possible. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I was a lot gentler on this in the, in the preview, but it's like just don't. You know, don't piss on me and tell me it's, that it's raining. <laughs> like, just be honest about it. Jesse, that's like the most... That Damn, that was harsh. Jesse got pissed. <laughs> no, you know what, though? He's, 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 he's real talk right here. He, that is exactly what it is. Don't tell us you're giving us gold bars when it's a boogers. My, my analogy, my metaphor also, wasn't... I mean, also apropos, yeah. I would tend to agree. I would prefer gold bars to boogers and don't like having them misrepresented. <laughs> Although on the other hand, I'd rather have boogers in my nose than gold bars. Okay, it's sure. It's hard to breathe. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have to have something in your nose, I'm, I'm talking in the hypothetical oh. that something must be in there. You mean gold bars in your nose? Okay. Yeah, like I don't want someone to put a gold bar in my nose. Like I'd rather have gold bars like in front of me than boogers, but I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. <laughs> boogers, man. What are we ever talking about? What are we doing? Anyways, that's my soapbox. On to news. News. Well, this isn't really a news item, but I did want to point out that um, one of our editors, the fine Neil Chandran, is actually working on a lot of interviews with voice actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just put up a feature. We interviewed, or rather he interviewed, Aaron Fitzgerald, who voiced <laughs> characters like Chie from Persona 4 and Agnes from Bravely Default. So, yeah, there's a cool interview up um, if you want to get a little glimpse at how she gets into character for her roles and... Uh, just generally why she's a cool person. You can check that out. You can go to the uh, features section of RPGFan.com. And right now it's still in our sidebar with a little cute little illustration. So uh, I would advise you to check that out. And we also have some more voice actor interviews coming up in the near future. Cool. So, yay. Good Ooh, job on that, Neil. Neil. Yeah, it's really cool to see him uh, reaching out and getting some, some new and unique coverage for us. Plus, I, I, like, I'm one of those people where I prefer dubs when they're done well <clears throat> i don't know why i'm like going through puberty today i really like dubs when they're like, done well. my boss i'm not cleaning the urinals at the movie theater <laughs> oh, oh gee that, me. he's gonna be really upset with me he's gonna put my hands in the deep fryer <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, american horror story season three this is getting messed up yeah oh so, god uh, that was an american horror story. oh why yeah, would you bring that up right? again no right? i thought it was in the simpsons well that too no, there's a there's a character in American Horror Story season three who's like a living voodoo doll, so she puts her hand in a deep fryer to deep fry. Did you like season three? I really liked season three. Um, I like it, but I don't think it was the best. I, I would still rank them two being the absolute best. What? Yeah. By really? Far. Yeah, two is the very very best. Oh, I then, hated two so then much. Three, then three, then one, then four. Four is just the worst. Uh, I didn't really get in four. Jackie and I could not finish. Uh, but I did not like two at all. Right. I found two to be a combination of like, you know, Nazi body horror and aliens, and was like, "What is going on here?" This but is I so like that. So all right, it was really weird. I yeah. really like three though, because it was like evil X Men, and I like that. I think I think three falls apart at the end, but it's a 
like, hey, that's your favorite phrase, Rob. It just falls apart at the end. That too much stuff falls apart at the end. That's the like problem. Like a pork roast in a crock pot. Just <laughs> mm. crock pot. What? The yeah. Kingdom Hearts presentation Delicious. is starting now. Oh, Cook God, pork Steve. in a crock pot. Oh, it gets man. all tender and falls Steven, off the bone. Just calm down. Yeah, you want you want a good pork to like apart. practically melt in your mouth. Oh man, are we talking about pork? Like right? Good? Yeah. Mm. He is from the south, ladies and gentlemen. He loves pork. Welcome to New Pork South. City. Well, you've lived in the South for a long time. Shut up! <laughs> Quiet you. South, South Carolina counts as the South, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it, does. it does. Yeah, but I'm not from there. I'm from South, Massachusetts. South Carolina is the South. South Carolina is one of my least favorite states. Sorry if you live there. Did they like... secede? Yes, yeah. they are the South. Well, okay, look. Did they I live. I... Yes, did they succeed? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's I, look, time. I live in a, in a state that is... South of the Mason Dixon line, but I am definitely north of the imaginary sweet tea line. So I'm in a I'm in a weird like limbo of southernness that, that's a, hard to explain. There's a sweet tea line in a circle around my body at all times. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it's just it's getting amazing. So I, I can't buy sun drop. I I don't get sweet tea automatically at restaurants, but technically I was in a state that seceded from the union and that's kind of weird and embarrassing. Yeah, don't do that. Don't I, don't secede. I, I won't. Okay, look, we learned our lesson. Maybe. Oh, and it's halftime. Haven't you been uh-huh. listening to Bobby Jindal? Okay, let's move on. Oh, let's boy. move on to news. Let's please wow. not talk about them. Moving on. Uh, I don't know if you discussed this on the last podcast at all, but so TriAce announced Exist Archive, which Ooh. is basically mm-hmm. like a sci-fi Valkyrie profile. I mean, it's got the same basic gameplay structure. It's got like a side scroll. You've got side scrolling dungeons. You have four character battles where each character acts independently. Like, it, it looks really cool. It's yeah. basically yeah. like a. And you also like. And... Go ahead. Sorry, but you also send like a character back to the other planet. You you like have to choose which character to to send to the other side every yeah. chapter. So. So this is very yeah. much just a Valkyrie profile with a different theme. I'm not a huge Valkyrie profile fan. Not not that I dislike. It. I just I. I played it sort of after its time, and I feel like it hasn't aged super well. It's a little obtuse, but like I'm really excited for this Exist Archive, and not least of which because it has Motoi Sakuraba, and all the sample music has Sakuraba able to do his thing rather than Sakuraba on Tales games. Yeah, exactly. I think Sakuraba um, flourishes talks. when he's not yeah. doing Tales soundtracks. What? Yeah, no. it's it's great. It's the the samples are great. The art style, I love it. Like, it's it's the sort of cutesy chibi look but without everybody having huge exposed boobs all the time yeah exactly like i was i was nervous when i heard the first article uh saying that the game was going to have a chibi style and i was like no and then they were like but, i think it's the love plus artist that's doing it so i was like oh boy boobs confirmed but uh, it's actually but, it looks fine like it looks like chibi is okay if it's not weirdly sexualized chibi yeah and you know if you if, if you like that that's fine too but i don't good uh, for you not for me I don't think it's fine that you like At that. At least the environment. <laughs> there are too many dungeon crawlers with weirdly sexualized chibi characters oh nowadays. My God. It, so... it creeps me out a little it's bit. It's like part of the genre at this point. It drives me nuts. That's why yeah. I like Extreme Odyssey so much. Like, I, I wish they, they could just exist as a thing and not be taking over what a quote-unquote standard RPG is like these days. I just, mm-hmm. I don't know why that's the norm suddenly. Yeah, well, it's like the difference between, although not that Xenoblade doesn't have Sharla, but like... Well, right. You know, it's the difference between a game that is like, I'm going to tell you a story, I have good art style and good graphics, and I'm not going to try to make an additional selling point, giant boobs, just because. And it also is different when there's one character that's, that's you know, an annoying chibi or weirdly sexualized, where it, <laughs> as opposed to where it pervades the entire art style and just makes you feel gross, like, reading an article about the game. Yeah, and, you know, not to bring up one of my favorite punching bags lately, but Dungeon Travelers 2, like... I've seen three screenshots of that game, and I'm just like, is this game known because it's a good game or because it has huge boobs on young girls? Yeah, just let it be like the boob game. It doesn't. Yeah, like don't like it's like now too many Tundra. games are the boob game. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, like, Omega the... Labyrinth. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, go ahead. Yeah, Omega Labyrinth. That That's new, what we're referencing. Yeah, new roguelike RPG. They, they they must have chosen Omega because of the the Greek symbol. So yeah. if you go to the website, like it's the Greek symbol is basically outlining her, her boobs. Oh 
no. Yeah. Uh, that's just a shame. That, yeah. That's the game where some of the mechanics include, like, there's a, a yeah. your your breasts get bigger as you go through the dungeons, and then yes. you do, like, a chest-bursting attack. You what? appraise chest. you appraise items by putting uh, them between the girl's breasts. What? I, to be fair, that is how I figure out prices at Target. Uh, <laughs> all right? I'm just Caitlin, saying. Well, that's... Like, yeah, Jackie Caitlin, has that available. So. Jackie <laughs> has that system available. I, I, I'm I sorry. It just... That's terrible. I'm yeah. really sorry about that. And then I think the thing that, that really made me go, ugh, was like there's a... You can give the girls in the game like a pheromone or something that puts them in a quote-unquote excited state, and then oh, you can boy. do a touch mini game with them. Like, oh, boy. It's just oh, like... It's, it's fine to have things that are sexual and even pornographic. Like... That's okay. Yeah, but there's a, there's like... a time and place for those. Well, no, yeah. but like not even that, but just tell me that's what your game's point is. Like, just yeah. don't pee on me and tell me it's raining. Like, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm I'm not gonna keep going back to that. <laughs> I, I've been pretty vocal with not being a huge fan of a lot of XC's project choices lately with the, t- the Trails games being no, the me neither. You know, they do, they do the pandery game to fund the real games. And I know that sounds incredibly elitist of me, but fine. It's my opinion, Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, if it gets us Tokyo Xanadu and East 8 in exactly. the next two years, then maybe I'm okay with it. But at least Exceed is not trying to tell you that Senran Kagura is some incredible action RPG with deep well, mechanics that are great. Some, some of the people who work for Exceed will actually argue that they are... That's true. Some some will. And, that, and that's, you know, that's their opinion. That's, you know, you should be passionate in the product you're working on. I, th- I think that's absolutely true. But a lot of, like, the XC blog, they will say, yeah, check it out. Here's a picture of a girl with huge boobs, and they're bouncing. Boob physics. And I'm like, all right, at least they're, that, you know, I have no interest in that. Right. But they're not lying and telling me it's some incredible game right. when I would much, the selling point is boobs. I would appreciate the, the honesty, really, more than anything. And I feel like games like Omega Labyrinth are trying to put up this facade like they're something that they're not. And that's what really bugs me about it. It sounds like you guys want honest boobs. I mean, I personally don't want the Honest boobs at boobs all. Or <laughs> like, that's fine. That's fine that they're there. I have nothing against that. It's just... It, also, actually, something I do legitimately have a, a problem with is the fact that all the girls are totally underage looking. Like, I don't yeah, care that's, that's tell me a problem. that she's but 18. Derek, they're aged she, up. They're actually ancient beings. She's clearly not 18. Right, like, okay, she's 300 years old, but she has the body of a 12-year-old. Look at her flat breasts. Like, wh- What? Like, sorry, no. Uh, you know, I absolutely despise the lore argument, and I've seen it made by a lot of people, you know, even people in the industry, where it's like, well, you see, actually, she's 900 years old, so it's totally okay. It's like, no, she is, this is a, I can't swear on this podcast. No, this is a don't BS excuse. This is an absolute BS emphasis excuse so you can show underage boobs. So just yeah. shut up. If, if you put that in front of a judge, they won't agree with the lower argument. So no. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's BS. It's a stupid misdirection, redirection tactic. It's nonsense, and I, it's unacceptable. I just, yeah, I don't need, I don't need kitty porn in my dungeon crawlers. Like, end of story. If, if yeah. you want to have a, a, a sexy like porno dungeon crawler that's that's fine just don't lie about what it is and don't put up a front like it's something else yeah and also i i just don't want that to be the 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 mainstream thing or you know mainstream i don't want that to be the baseline experience for rpgs because that's what it's becoming it feels like yeah no i completely agree derek i made this and like i when i was playing xenoblade a couple months ago and finishing it like i kept tweeting i'm like these are the jrpgs i want to play where there's and i this is going to be this is biased but where there's integrity behind how it's designed it's not like well, we made some still anime shots, and that's all the cutscenes. And you're gonna roam a dungeon with one wall per set, and there's five dungeons and turn-based combat with items and special skills and a skill tree and uh, giant boobs everywhere. Like that's that's so many JRPGs now, and I don't want that to be the norm. Yeah, God, yeah. And covering those for news is just right because you <laughs> have that to. Was try the it, like... I made that was the argument I made. I was like, I don't want to cover these anymore. Sorry, sorry to interject, but uh. Square Enix USA during this Kingdom Hearts this Disney interactive presentation just tweeted that new info is coming. So I'm assuming that within moments there's going to be something new for Kingdom Please Hearts. Please look forward to it. Five news. <laughs> oh no, it'll be like the 15 stream. We have decided on a release date. Please look forward to it. We, we have decided on the announcement date for the announcement of the release date. But we're not oh, boy. Yet. And speaking of which, who who cares about Dragon Quest? Not you guys. All right, we're not going to talk about it. Uh, well, I mean, look, well, it's at the it's at the Disney trade show, so they're yeah. not going to, I mean, that's a little unfair, but I mean, PAX is in a week and a half or so, TGS mm-hmm. is in about a month, 
Are you so, guys, am I the only one, I know Steven's going to argue with me right now and say that I'm just predisposed to hating J.J. Abrams and Star Wars, but hear me out right now. You are, so go it, ahead. Is anybody else just feeling a little bit of Star Wars fatigue already and we don't even have one of these goddamn movies out yet? Yeah, they just announced uh, no, two no, Star Wars it. theme parks. That's bananas. That's. I think it's all fantastic, to be honest. We have been wanting for decades to have more extended universe Star Wars material, and now we have it and people are complaining. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not I have anything. not been arguing for that. Well, I, well, I have not. Because the EU is arguably more interesting than the main films themselves. That is fair. Certainly that's the fair. prequel trilogy. And like people are like, oh, there's so many spinoffs. And I'm like, that's the glory of this. This world supports that sort of thing. Uh, like, would I, I have gone but... with a Han Solo film up front? No. But Rogue One looks awesome. I'm more excited for Rogue One than Episode Seven. Because it's a different it, – it, think about it in Marvel terms where Marvel is experimenting with different genres within superhero movie. You have like Ant-Man is a heist film. You have Guardians of the Galaxy is like a space adventure film. You know, Rogue One is like a gritty war movie set in Star Wars. It's what episode one through three wanted to be and wasn't. I guess I'm, I'm on board. I just – I don't know. I, I'm just feeling a little bit of fatigue already and we don't even have one of these movies out yet. And so I, I kind of just want to like, I, I don't even know what to get excited for yet. <clears throat> I, I don't think I can feel fatigue until I see at least one of the movies. Like, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate the there's a there is a lot coming, but to be fair, there's always been a lot of Star Wars stuff. Yeah. There has been. It's only now are there are a lot of Star Wars films. That's true. That's true. It's, I mean, and if you're sick of it now, Rob, I hate to tell you, but Disney is very interested in making Star Wars like that big to all people. So there's only going to be more coming. I know, I know. I just, I don't know. I, it's been a long time since I was excited about Star Wars, and maybe it'll all be good. Maybe we'll be okay. But when they announce that like Kingdom Hearts is going to have Star Wars in it, I'm not going to be excited. I'm going to be like, oh, okay, that's that's nice. You don't well, want a party I'm, of I'm so, of Sora, cut. Wolverine, and Han Solo. <laughs> I think my body just can't handle that. I want it. I want it. Dude, yeah. no. Kingdom Hearts 3 has the best world potential they've ever had. They can have Pixar now. They can have Star Wars. They can have Marvel. I want Wally. I want the Wally world. Oh. Not, not you Wally. Know, in fact, Wally. here's what they do. Just make yes. every world a Pixar world. That's fine with me. Yeah. Every world a Pixar world, then let me go kill the Death Star, then let me go fight the aliens from Avengers. We're good to go. It could be that interesting. That sounds like a pretty dope game. It does. Yeah. It sounds crazy. It, it might be okay. Maybe we'll maybe we're gonna get good Star Wars movies. I just I, I I don't know. Like the already announcing a director for Episode Nine is like the Disney money making machine is in full effect right now, regardless of how the first movie has even been shown. I mean, they're doing the same thing that they're seems like they're doing the same thing that they're doing with Marvel, right? Yeah. Like yeah. really yeah. planning it out like meticulously. Yeah, I mean, they've announced Marvel movies through 2020 or something. So. Yeah, and, and to yeah. be fair, I'm also tired of those. I, I am okay. so tired of Marvel movies right now. I'm kind of like, okay, th this was fun, but I'm kind of getting a little bored. I liked Ant Man. I didn't yeah, see I just it. saw that. I, I, haven't, saw seen, that, uh, I haven't seen it yet either. Two days ago, I actually liked it. It was fun. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, the worst part about Ant Man was the uh, contrived romance that didn't need to exist. Oh. See, I actually thought the worst part was the villain because he, so, he was. The bad guy was literal Hitler. Like, <laughs> he was too evil when he showed up the first time, and then he just kept getting more and more, like, inexplicably, horrifyingly just yeah. monstrous. Was it Corey Stahl? It was Corey Stahl, wasn't it, from House of Cards and Yeah, and, and like, Strain. it wasn't the fault of his acting. It was just that, like, every line he had was like, I'm clearly the bad guy. Yeah, exactly. I'm getting more and more evil. Villainy personified. He was yeah. the Red Skull. He was a, a literal Nazi. It, yeah, it was kind of ridiculous. Oh. Well, anyway. I, I, I'm just feeling a little overwhelmed. I, I think it's also, like, the, the problem of having so much media to consume right now. I'm just like, ugh. So you. many things what? to watch. There's too much content? There, there too is too much things. content. I'm getting tired of content. All right, I'm, so... Uh, we are... Uh, Caitlin and I are silently live-streaming the Kingdom Hearts thing right now, and I'm desperately trying to say something about content that's relevant to our conversation, but I'm rapidly losing. Uh, okay. Well, Derek, do you have any other news for us, or should we let Steven go so we can watch uh, Hearts? My last, my last news story was just that Legend of Legacy, which is coming out here on the 13th of October, is going to be getting a limited edition launch copy thing 
that includes a, a hardcover soundtrack. Sorry, hardcover art book. A hardcover soundtrack? I think they're hard anyway. And a, <laughs> a 10 disc soundtrack sampler. Uh, it looks, I think one of the best things about that game is the artwork, specifically the, uh, like the actual legacy artwork. I forget. Oh, I feel so bad now. What's the name of the artist who worked on Saga Frontier? Oh, oh. no, I can't remember. Yeah, I can. Why look does it, it look so much like Bravely Default? Is it the same artist? No. No, no they just wanted the TV. Did you play it at E3? I it's, don't really think it looks I did. like Bravely Default. It, it is Tomomi Kobayashi. That's the name of the artist who worked on Saga Frontier. Um, no, it doesn't look like Bravely Default. The character, they're like super deformed character models, but they don't really look the same. Uh, maybe, maybe I just haven't looked at it enough. Do you, do you think I'm gonna like that game? I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you will. I don't know if you will. It's, it looks cool. It's, it's very much just the next Saga Frontier. So you pick uh, a character, you make a party of three of the seven playable characters at the beginning, and you oh. explore this island, and it's supposedly kind of freeform. Like you just explore where you want, um, progress at your own pace, like make your own party with your own strategies and blah, blah, blah. Like, there are no classes for the characters. It's just all... you. It's free <laughs> for them to build them. Uh, what happened, Steven? Big Hero 6 World. <laughs> oh, I meant to watch that last night. Oh, that I movie was that. awesome. Big Hero 6 was really good. It's worth watching. That movie was oh, adorable. Good. Oh, my Jack, God. Baymax is going to be your party member. That it's like it, it's like Frozen is a girl is a movie about sisterhood and being a princess, and the next year they have a movie about brotherhood and being a hero, and it's, it's awesome. It's a great movie. Oh, Steve. oh my God. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great news. I love that movie. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's all good. That's, no, that's no, all... no. I mean, this is entertaining. Just hearing your reactions as it's happening. <laughs> I would agree. I even would if agree. it even if it does date the time this podcast is being report recorded a little bit. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll get it out like tomorrow, right, Rob? Uh, that's my hope. I've actually been doing a good job of getting these out, man. Don't come at me like that. Just kidding. I respect you, bro. I respect you. <laughs> yeah, oh, so... um. That's One it, very it. unrelated small piece of news, uh, Runic Games, the people that make Torchlight, which is a seri- two games that I adore, are announcing their new game at PAX in a week and a half. Oh, cool. Yeah, but it's not going to be what? Torchlight related. I'm excited for that. Yep. There's going to be a lot of RPGs at PAX, it seems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey. Hey. I heard you that. You say it like it's a problem. No, well, it's a problem that I have to cover all of them. And okay. Okay. Them. okay. All right, that's actually a fair problem. All right. <laughs> All right, I think we should probably let this podcast go so that Stephen can go get really excited about his Kingdom Hearts and be all sure. be all excited. So yeah. every Keyblade will have a unique transformation. Oh no! <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you everybody for listening to the show. Uh, episode 100 is right around the corner, so everybody should get really excited for that. Uh, for oh god everybody steven derek jesse mike and caitlin thank you everybody and we will see you all later see you bye